Ladies and gentlemen, what it do though? Tell him, Nushi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you though. <laughs> After a two week hiatus, we back slapping, blapping, cracking on cats. Tell him. Roushi, how you feeling? I'm feeling good though. I'm feeling gorgeous though. Today, y'all get to hear one of the most intimate reflections and recollections on a story of somebody that truly is the epitome of a degree of separation from anybody and everybody in the culture. But unbeknownst to many, the actualization of the concept of there being a story behind every smile in this episode is truly actualized. And we're fortunate enough to go through the journey of one of my heroes. And without further ado, let us take you to the story of AJ Rolland. Ah. Uh, Mama! Mama! We made it! What it, what it, what it do to <laughs> You guys record that live every time? Every <laughs> fucking oh, time. I thought it was a pre-record. Everybody does. <laughs> Little but thing. we blap them with it every time. Wow. Way to set the tone. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> we Hold on. Oh, I was a little nervous, but now I feel comfortable. I'm glad you do. <laughs> Look like at that. Low-key verbal asterisk. We all did fucking a series of push-ups, and I was the fat one out first. Let's be very honest. A uh, little change of state. Shout out to Steve. But you, you did good, though. There's no good. need to baby me, bro. I don't yeah. want a participation I went trophy. That P90 I went... Nushi. Yeah. <laughs> P Nushi X. P Nushi X. Biometric Ooh. Nushi. German potato soup. <laughs> Rome was not built in one day. Neither were my jelly rolls. You know what I'm saying? It took a long time to cultivate these. Ladies and gentlemen, we have my brother from another AJ Rolland in the building. Round of a motherfucking applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And just to skip the whole fucking monologue that I could go on, Ooh. I just want to say this man is probably one of the single biggest forces in my life and also just in my realization of selfhood. You feel me? Mm. And it comes from his freeness and openness and willingness to like be him whatever it was during that process at a time where I was going through that and I was scared as fuck to do it but I had a big brother that I literally looked up to and he could be five foot three and I'd still look up to him thank god you're not I'm six one and a half you better fucking believe give it give me my half do not give get me it my twisted one and a half. your half is there you're almost in three quarters. I'm, I might be six two, but the crazy thing is people don't really realize I'm like taller until like the eighth time that they've met me. They're like, you're really tall. I'm like, yeah. It's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast and motherfucking deep dive into this story. Yeah, can't this Happy to be here, man. Excited. Likewise. Yo, I want to start out from the beginning because it's crazy when, you know, we, we've had these discussions all the time of like, Everything that happens to us really accumulate and, and add into who we become at different stages and who we ultimately are in the, in the scheme of things. And one thing I know about your story, because we've spoken about it, is how, I don't know, like, I try and find the word, but like how arduous your childhood was, but how much it set the tone mm. for who you are. And I want to dive into like that dynamic from, like the family home, what it was like growing up and becoming you and what you had to go through during then. Because I feel like you're one of those souls that a lot of people don't realize that like was literally working from the jump, like man of the house from the jump. Mm. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like take us through your childhood. Where did you grow up? Like what? Yeah, I was, um, so I was born in uh, Detroit, Michigan. Um, so I entered this earth. Uh, my earliest memories are in Los Angeles. So, uh, few, first few years in Michigan, um, uh, drove around for a little bit, settled in LA. I think I was like two or three. You yeah. never get the real story from my mom, but some of my earliest memories kind of kick in. Uh, grew up here in LA. 
had my mother, my grandmother came up, my mom and my dad split up. So she left them back in Michigan, back in Detroit. Mm. And uh, my grandmother heard about it. Her only daughter um, was in America by herself. And um, she raising a man on her own. So she came to help. She left her whole life. My mom has a very big family. Uh, she had like five brothers. Oh, wow. And like a lot of uncles and aunts and mm. everybody. And my grandma was like the matriarch of the family. And she just like, nah, fuck that. I'm, I'm wow. Old. So she came out here. Didn't know any English. Where'd uh, she come from? India. Mm. So uh, my mom's from India. My grandma, obviously, that's where she was born and raised. And uh, yeah, man, just came here, moved to L.A. And uh, L.A. kid, I can't say I was born and raised, but I'm definitely an L.A. guy. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, two years old is fair. Yeah, right? You got to round, you got to round. You get the pass there. Yeah, yeah. You, you get the pass it, too. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Like, if your first memory's from L.A., yeah. I feel you. It's the best city in the world, man. Off rip. Yeah. Where, where, what area did you grow up in? So when we first moved to L.A., uh, we had a one-bedroom apartment in Inglewood. Um, so uh, that's where we were at. And then, um, yeah, and then we, we moved around. We bounced around, like, you know, around the West L.A. area, settled, like, around West L.A. Palms. And that's where um, all my formative my formative years took place. Did nice. mm. you, to, you go to Palms? I did not. Oh. Um my mom always she 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 grew up in India, but she went to Catholic school. So she made sure that I, you know, if you're drawing upon, if we're talking about the influence and the impact that people's family and their parents have on him, on them, right? You, yeah. They, what you really just draw upon, bless you. Bless you just you. draw draw upon your journey, and you try to emulate that. So, my mom went to Catholic school, so she sent me. You know, it's funny. She sent me to like a little. Uh, Montessori preschool situation, like right down the street, and so that's where I kind of started. And then there's this one kid that she she met his mom, and then basically every school that he went to, she like uh, asked his mom, like, "Where is he going to first grade? No. Oh, he's going wow. here, and where's he going to high school? All right, well, that's where AJ's gonna go." I'm like, "Damn." <laughs> were you friends with the kid? Yeah, we were, okay. we were cool. <laughs> we, like, we had to be. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're, we're, we're like, really I think him? about it. And like in, in hindsight, I'm, I'm grateful for like you know. Yeah. The the help or the the guidance. You know? Did you switch schools often early? Like, no, I went to I went to the school called um, right right over right over here by uh, Rancho Park Golf Course called mm. St. Timothy. It's right next to Fox. Yeah, yeah, right there. Yeah, I did first through eighth grade there, and then um, I did the the all boys Catholic school. I went to Loyola in downtown LA. Word. That's where I did my uh, my uh, high school. What, what were area. no? That's, that's college. We <laughs> <laughs> secondary. <laughs> Stupid um, Bless you. Bless you. You're next. EDP. Um, w- w- yo, what was elementary school like for you? Because, like, coming from, you know, w- w- was your mother in the States before having you? Like, was she settled no, in the States? A, my mom has a crazy story. And if, if and a lot of, you know, so my mom was um, the middle child of seven, <sighs> all boys. Wow. You know, stop. So she was, she, she filled that role, you know, like in, there's a very different culture in India, especially at the time when she was growing up. So, you know, um, men and women have a very distinct role or traditionally, mm-hmm. and that's who they are. And that's where you kind of fit in for the most part. And yeah. So, uh, she, she was beautiful. I've seen photos of her when she's younger. She's a beautiful woman. Uh, and she, uh, but she was quiet. She's very, like do what you're told type. So she had a, in India, the, the common practice is, you know, you have arranged marriages and my mom was married off to a man and, um, it's not a cool situation, mm. but, um, it's just tough because when you're divorced Absolutely. is a thing. And when like, the culture like sets like that culture precedent in a country like yeah. that. So you get divorced and you're a woman, you're, you're not, you know, like you're, you have to start from nothing, literally, mm. you know? Um, so, you know, it didn't work out. It wasn't the best situation. And she, uh, she decided to come to the United States for a visit. She had a friend that lived here mm. in New Jersey and she came to visit and, um, you know, just take some time off and never left India at the time. And she hasn't gone back ever since. Wow. wow. Yeah. So she, um, commuted from Jersey to New York. She worked in Queens. That's where she met my dad. Somehow they ended up in Detroit. I'd never get the straight story on that. <laughs> and then um and there was me. Wow. Yeah. 
it's evident that your mother is an extremely strong woman. Yeah. Right? One woman in a group 100%. of guys. Strongest person I've ever met in my life. Most re resilient. Yeah. Yeah. And also being, like, even back then, being able to make a decision like that of, like, look, this isn't working for me. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this. As much stigma as, as was, is put on those types of things, especially in the Indian community, yeah. to, to be able to do that. What was it like growing up with that kind of, like, quintessential matriarchal figure as a kid who damn well was equipped to play the role of mother and father in terms of like being stern when she needed to and being just like raised in this community. Like how was the upbringing like with like culture at home and culture in where you were in Los Angeles at the time? Um, my mom had a very different parenting style. So she was, um, she you know, like when you're a single mother, you're like mother and father. Mm -hmm. So she took on the more father role. Mm. You know, she, uh, she, man, she's like the definition that started from the bottom, bro. Like she moved here. Um, when we moved to LA, we didn't have shit. She was working at like, she was working at like Walmart, Burger King. Like mm. those were the jobs that she was all like eight months pregnant, taking the bus to Walmart. Wow. Like, you know, like that was her, her, her thing. Um, not to dig too much into to that situation, but she came to LA. It's like, what am I gonna do? I'm in a I'm in a new city in yeah. a country that I haven't been in. I'm Indian. I'm a woman. Yeah. I'm you know who am I? So she was like, how am I gonna? I got a kid now. My mother's out here. Mm. You know, like I'm in LA. Yeah, right? it's like you make it here, you make it anywhere. Absolutely. She's like um, going to church and temple or whatever, and she's like, yo. She had her brother mail, she would mail, uh, he would mail us Bollywood movies on VHS. <laughs> okay. and my mom took an ad out in the yellow pages. And, um, the ad basically was like in the video rental section where Blockbuster would have been RIP Blockbuster. All right. And it would, and she, ran, she literally called herself the Bollywood bo Blockbuster. Wow. So she would supply, like all the new releases would come out and people would hit her up. Like, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a market for everything. Right? Yeah. So she found this market and people would hit her up and they'd find a way to meet up, whether, you know, depending on who it was, would come to the crib. And, Super brick and mortar. Or just meet up somewhere and um, hand it off on her system. And then it evolved into people saying, like, I have XYZ format tape. Um, it's different in India or England or there's mm. all different tape formats. Can you convert? Can you do, do conversions? So oh, like wow. after enough asks, she bust open her little piggy bank. She buy, she bought a little converter set up yeah. and now she does conversions. Oh, so wow. like when you go time to renew your yellow page ad, throw conversions. <laughs> <on. laughs> Yo, uh, let me get five copies of this. Can I get 10? Can I get 20? Can I get a hundred? Sure. Back then. Yeah, no, she's like, yeah, but it's like, you got two VCRs and you're sitting here pushing play, play and record on every one. Yeah. Yeah. And then little eight year old AJ is on the Microsoft, uh, the Windows 95. Yep. Making wow. labels to go on the VHS tapes, making uh, sleeves for the tapes to go in, shrink wrapping them. And, um, you know, and then it got to the point where it's like, all right, cool. I have, uh, I have this film from like the 50s, like eight millimeter film or 16 millimeter film. Can you convert it to VHS? This is my parents' wedding and I want to, you know, or, you know, can you convert this film? So I'm like splicing film, converting it to whatchamacallit. And then like I became a, I was a certified offline editor at age 10. No bullshit. Wild. My weekends were... XYZ's high school football highlight reel. Let's edit it, cut it together, Yo. throw the special effects on there, throw some whatever the music was. You know, it wasn't advanced. It was like literally, you know, assemble, insert edits and shit. So, and I'm like, I'm sitting there hot, right? Like all my friends are riding yeah. bikes and doing all this shit. And I'm like, I'm like, mom, what the fuck? she's like, you want to eat? I'm like, all right, <laughs> spice it up. Wow. So like, but it was like, it was cool to watch that. Like that was in our house. You know, like we had a two bedroom apartment. One is where like we slept and the other one was her office or like a tape racks or, you know, it's, it's all the same stuff. So, um, yeah, work. Wow. So you got yeah. thrown in immediately. Yeah. I don't even think you knew that story and that's how you set up this whole conversation. But yeah, I'm like, oh, I guess we talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, yeah. 
what was it like for you, especially in those like initial phases, right? Like looking back on it now, naturally, like it is what it is, right? What was it like for you as a kid, knowing like naturally you're not gonna uh, contest your mother and especially like the the matri patriarch, mm. right? And and that's the hustle and this is what you're doing. You already opted in. You had no choice. What was it like for you? Was this something that, that, that went on for quite some time or were you able to like find your pockets of like youthful activities and like playing with your friends? Yeah, I, I had a lot of freedom. So, um, there were no real tasks, no deadlines, no, you know, like it's like, yo, this is what needs to get done. But like it was more supportive. Like there was, it wasn't like a slave ship. Yeah, you know? sure, it was sure. like, we're building like a it was. It also wasn't. Nowhere. I mean, because it wasn't like rolling in like that. Yeah. It's just when it came up, it's like, hey, we could we could save on some labor. You know Word. what I'm saying? So absolutely. It, but it was all good. Like I'm, I was down, and I'm, and I'm now in hindsight, I'm grateful for the the experience and to be able to share that. Like I think that's a dope ass story. It's amazing. You know? yeah. So incredible. Um, yeah, I had I had a lot of autonomy. I had a lot of freedom. Never, I wasn't the kid with the curfew. Um, I just got a, I got away with a lot of shit. What kind of kid were you? Cause like, and the reason why I ask that is because you're such a special person now, right? And like, and I say this with like utmost honesty. It's like because I like I've been privileged enough to like be able to like be around you, and and see and experience you as a human being for for quite some time, especially like in my developmental like young man years. You feel me? But for somebody to be like you, like I want to know what like you were like as a kid. W were you always as open? Were you exploring? What was that childhood like? Yeah, I um, I just like to have a good time. Yeah, you know, like I'd um, ever since I I could remember, I liked bringing gr different groups of people together. Mm. You know, so um, like as far as student, I was a straight A student, but my conduct would be all bad. Like I just wasn't compliant mm. with the authority you yeah know? um and then in my off time i just like i said i had no rules i just go go do stuff and then come home when i came home relatively reasonable until i had like you know first time i could i could uh ride with a friend who had a car or yeah. when i got a car and yeah. I, I would push it because you know it's you, you know you, you you see where your lenience is so like i was always i always I killed it. On, I, I killed it on the books. Wow. Like I was. I was. Did she have the precedent? Because like, w when I was growing up, my parents literally said, "Get good grades. We don't care what you do." So for me, knowing I had that type of freedom yeah. to like show that I can get good grades, it became easy. What's, what's good though, right? Like, I mean, I feel like immigrant parents have the highest standard. Look, like, so it's like A. Yeah. You got an A minus. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I was lucky to not have like the like the A minus B plus thing, but like yeah. I always had a four point oh, three point eight, and higher, right? Yeah. But I was always very absent, knowing that my parents had my back, but. Growing up with that kind of responsibility, but also freedom that came with it, you take advantage of that. Right. You know what I'm saying? And was it one of those things where it was like total autonomy and freedom or look, show that you're doing well and you're you? All of the above. Word. Like it wasn't, um, I was very alone as a child. Growing up. How so? Alone, but alone in the sense of figure it out. Like, this is not mm. how it's done. Yeah. Um, I always joke, I'm like, uh, TGIF taught me. Yeah. Right, it was that. It was that. It was that. That. Uh, that. That boy meets world. Straight up. Full house. Family, uh, family matters, matters. Step by step. step, by step, step full yeah. house. Fresh Prince. Yep. Like that's where I, you think you know, like, and it, it's it's um yeah. And I, I feel like it's, it's taught a lot of people subliminally. Absolutely. Subliminally, subconsciously. Shout out to so, Mr. Sweeney, bro. Yeah. Uh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> Carl Winslow, my guy. <laughs> Uncle Phil. For real. Yeah, Tim the Tool Man Taylor, bro. Woo. Don't remember any of the step by step people. <laughs> the, the opening jingle. Step by step. step. Day, by, <laughs> day, by day by day. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like I think about having a lot of freedom as a kid, 
immediately it's I think it's natural to think like you would get into trouble. Yeah. With that freedom, like without having a, a strict curfew or hey, figure it out. I feel like you would tend to be like, okay, well, that's going to put you on this kind of tra- trajectory. Yeah. Uh, did you ever get into trouble? Were you that kind of kid or? I never really, I, like, I never really, I was very tempered in my mischief. You know, like, I never really got caught. And if I did, I'd have a plan on how I would escape the consequences, mm. if that makes any sense. Which I thought made me smart, you know, like, mm-hmm. which kind of became a hindrance, you know, in, in the mm. long in the long run, in terms of like how you deal with stuff when it comes up. Um, but for the most part, I, I was pretty good. I had everybody fooled. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever rebel or have those moments? Like, I'm trying to think because you you didn't have siblings either, right? No, nah, only child that I know of. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that you know. Because with your with your mom such a figure like that, just kind of want to think about how you how you kind of dealt with that as a kid. You know, as a kid, that you go through so many crazy phases. You're like when you're a teenager, your home your hormones are like off the charts. Yeah. When you're, you know, in elementary school, you're getting pressured of like what's cool, what's not. You're influenced by other kids. You know, maybe the things they have that you don't. All those things start to play. Um, very big factors in kind of your formative years. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like the character you are. Like, you know, I don't know you before this podcast and the, the, the things that kind of shaped you. And growing up in that environment with no siblings and a mother who worked very hard and you supported that, your character as a kid, it sounds like you had, you still had kind of um, had to be a good kid because of the respect for your mom. Yeah. But what was that kind of like? Did you ever have that battle dealing with the other kids around you or that other environment? Because you went to a pretty good school in a pretty good area. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure you you, you were with a lot of kids who had more privilege. Than it's, you. it's hard, man, because it's like, you know, and, and I believe your formative years dictate uh, uh, a significant portion of your early adult life. And then however, however long you go before you decide to look inside and do some deeper work on yourself. Right. Mm. So. I think so. what was tough for me, like my mom, we never really had a lot of money, but like whatever she had, the first dollar would go to education. Mm. So, but it, it's, it's interesting because it would be like, hey, you're going to go to the school, but I can't drop you off. So you have to take the bus. Oh, wow. Whereas other kids might have like drivers, you yeah. know? So I'm like waking up at 6 a.m. Wow. to catch three buses to get to like third grade Mm -hmm. where, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you see it, you notice it. And, um, like my situation wasn't like really a secret. So like other people's parents, like you'd be, I had, I've never had a problem making friends ever. Like I've, I've never, ever, I've always, you know, I, I, that's one of the things that I'm most grateful for. Like Mm -hmm. the people in my life on, uh, you know, but, um, there was a lot of reliance on exposure to things like sports yeah, or, you know, like extracurricular, any just extracurricular activities in general. So yeah. those are the things that I'm most grateful for. Mm. It's being in a position where I get to formulate these relationships and people, you know, people just include you, yeah. you know, and uh, it's crazy the sacrifices that, that parents make. And especially I feel like this is really prevalent among, amongst immigrant parents, right? Where they come to this country and they realize like, okay, I'm raising a child. I have to set them up mm-hmm. for success, right? No matter what the, the, the caveats or like how imperfect it may be in, in the moment, like the fact that your mom focused everything on, okay, I'm going to make sure my son has it all. Right. It may not be perfect, but I'm going to make sure he has it all. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's it's beautiful to think about that in terms of like parenting, bro, because it's like regardless of how hard it is, I feel like when you go through something like that, you know that's what's being done. Yeah. Like there's a difference there. Whatever like isn't isn't present, it's still like shielded from the fact of like wow, okay, like we have a responsibility here. Yeah. 
What were some of the, the, the extracurricular activities that you were a part of? Like, what, like, were you playing sports? Were you? Yeah, I did, I did all the, uh, I, I had a normal, like, would seem to be normal. I just knew it was a little different because yeah. I knew my mom needed a little help on yeah. the, like, time. You know, like, that's just something you need. Like, uh, time is important. You know, like, Absolutely. Sp- interfacing. Looking at somebody in the eye, telling them, explaining very rudimentary why this is the way that it is. And, and that's why it's so important to be present with your child. I'm a new father. So like, um, and I'm learning. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, man. Best shit ever. Highly recommend it. But, <laughs> but take your time. <laughs> take your time. Take your time, folks. Take your time. Um, I was very fortunate to befriend some incredible people that exposed me to to film and sports and video games and music. Oh, my God. My best friend growing up. I met him in third grade. Um, his name was Chris Martin. Shout out Chris Martin. Shout what out to Chris the Martin. other Chris Martin. To the other Chris Martin. And, man, like this dude, me and this dude were on like White on Rice. Like inseparable. Um, his his dad was like my like first real man father mm-hmm. figure, Do- doctor. Wanted to be a doctor, you know. Like uh, I was like, oh, Wayne Martin's a doctor. I'm gonna be wow. a doctor. Yeah. His mom was a doctor, but you know, I already had a mom, so I was cool. But like, you know, she's like my second mom. I love yeah. her to death. Um, Shout out to so the yeah, Martins. Like boom, year after year, just growing and growing and growing. And um, in eighth grade, he moved away to the Inland Empire. He lived. He moved to Chino Hills, and like wow. we were so cool that I would. And I took the bus everywhere, bro. Like I'm talking about yeah, the Metro MTD, pass. the Blue Bus, yeah. the Culver City Bus. You were, I had you... all the passes. I knew all the transfer routes. I knew the bus drivers by name. Wild. I'm talking about forever to the point where, like, when he moved to Chino Hills, I would take the bus from LA from downtown Los Angeles Wild. to the Inland Empire to kick it for the weekend. <laughs> That's so And then his mom would lit. be like, you, you are know how hard here. That is? It's hard. That's, it's it's hard. long. That's very hard. And um yeah man, like I was just so grateful. He had a he had a little brother, he had a baby sister. Um like they had a normal life. They Thanksgiving, I got to experience Christmas, um vacations, camping. Basic shit that yeah. everybody, like most people get to do that, you know, a lot of people take for granted. And, um, yeah, thank God for that guy. That's and thank God for, for the, that, I mean, it was, it was amazing. Like it was. It was he got great. you into music? Yeah. I mean, I, we went to the Century City Mall for like a field trip and it was a movie field trip. And we saw Mr. Holland's Opus <laughs> with Richard Dreyfus. Good movie from what I remember. But right next to it, there was a uh, Sam Goody. And the very first, uh, the, the, it was uh, The Roots, Illadelph, Half-Life, Ooh, and Nas, It Was album. Written. Ooh, wow. My first two cassettes that I bought. And he bought Legendary Exhibit, yeah. the blue one, the one with, uh, what was that called? Was it at the Bang. speed of life? And is that the one with that's the one? Is that the one pa- pa- paparazzi on? Oh, it? bro, exhibit, yeah. yeah. Woo! Exhibit was like uh, he was the yeah, man. Yeah, but pre pre pimp my ride, with, like then he's there. Pre pimp my ride, exhibit was the <laughs> shit. Yeah, I love that it's paparazzi. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, man, that was that. But it was all you know what it was. It was his dad used to take us to soccer practice. And he didn't think that we knew, but he was he was playing Dr. Dre the Chronic. Stop that! And he thought it was low, and we weren't paying attention, and we didn't know what anything meant. His father was paying, His, bro. And he wouldn't. And to this a doctor, day, bro. Doctor Martin. Doctor Martin. Recently, with Dr. Dre, I gave him a, 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 an autographed vinyl of a Nas album. I was like, "Listen to this; you'll appreciate this." Wow. And he was like, "You know what? I I I, I like this. Like I like I can because." When we started getting kind of like wind of it, he would he would him and uh, Mrs. Martin would would just shit on hip hop. They're like, "That's bullshit!" Like it was. I'm like, oh, "You were listening to the Gronick. like." So we just like that was like our thing that we did on the low. We just look like listen around. This is pre obviously pre Napster, yeah, the internet. Of course, of course. Yeah. What grade were you in like when this shit was popping off? What? What grade were you in? 
Uh, I started in like third, fourth grade. Word. Yeah, I fell in love with like music third, fourth grade. <laughs> it's a beautiful journey. Music is awesome. I want to ask you like, you come off like okay, scratch that. You're a dreamer in my eyes, right? When you were going through school, we know it wasn't athletics. Like, you weren't star football fucking quarterback. Nobody said that, I yeah. wasn't star football quarterback. Were you? Nah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I'm like. Right? Like, I, I'm, I'm going to give myself a, a scenario to stay correct. Oh, rip, damn. Word? What made you think that? Um, but naturally, it's like. You're you're the community builder, and we spoke about this shit, right? But like, you you are you are the community builder, right? And naturally, I'm gonna make a bold assumption that it was like prevalent coming up, growing up, right? What what were your like dreams? Because like, like I know you personally, and even now, and I want to kind of dive into like as a kid what it was because like. Your streams of consciousness are the most brilliant brain farts I've ever like had the the opportunity to experience. Right, as a kid, did your mind stray like that? And and were you like, what what were you thinking? And like what like what were your ambitions and dreams, like as a youth? I think. Like, at first, I wanted to be, like, so Indian kids are like, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you grow mm-hmm. up in a house, like, that's that's a lot of, like, Asian, Eurasian, yeah. East Asian, cultural, doctor, engineer, yeah. whatever, secure, stable. Yep, sure. And, um, so grow, like, growing up through, like, my middle school, high school years, like, the closest thing I had to a dad was a doctor. Yeah. And then, um, so I was like, I want to be a doctor. That's what I want to be. And then when I was, um, it was the summer before I went from eighth grade to high school. And um, my mother got in like a, a, a really, really, really bad car accident. <sighs> and remember, I'm like a, I'm a only child. Yeah. Guy. So, and I, so when I, like, when I, I, we obviously, we weren't together when it happened. And uh, when I finally heard about it, it was like nine hours after the fact. Your mom's at um, UCLA. She's in the intensive care unit. Um, I'm like, cool. Not cool, but like, what happened? Yeah. I got a ride there. I walk in. She's out. Coma. Oh, my God. Stop. So I'm, uh, my, and my grandmother's in, in, she went to India for like a trip or whatever. So it's just me and my mom, 13. Um, she's in a coma at UCLA in the intensive care unit after... Getting into a car accident and her basic, like her entire, like stomach, intestines, all of that just blew up, basically. God, dude. And um, so I'm like just sitting there. And so the way that it worked was my mom had, we, she'd grown out of our apartment. She had an office um, with all her different production services and editing suites. So, like, Whenever she wasn't there, either somebody would just be there, right? It's like manning the ship. Yeah. Yeah. So it would either be my grandmother, who, mind you, to this day doesn't speak any English, <laughs> but we'll talk about that later, or me, just as a presence. Yeah, like, word. physically there, I'm here, don't try no shit, yeah. right? Yep. Um, and so I was just, yeah, I was in one of those situations. My grandma's gone, and she was out for a few days, and she she woke up. And the first thing she said when she saw me was, who's at the office? Wow. And I'm like, you know, I'm sitting there like 13. <laughs> I've been alone for like three days. Yeah. Who fed me? <laughs> Who made sure I did, you know, like whatever? You know, like, are you, you know, it's like, who's, at, you know, and it's like, you know, at the, at the time you're just kind of like, all right, that's cool. Um, you know, so then there's that recovery period. She, she woke up, she bounced back and, you know, that's in a whole nother thing. Um, but when she came home, she had, she had an open wound in her stomach and like the nurse was like, well, you have the option or somebody else has the option that's in the house that can do this. And, um, the minute I saw blood, I was like, fuck that. I don't want to be a doctor anymore. (laughs) 
All that to say is my ambitions were I wanted to be a doctor because my play daddy was a doctor. And you I saw some blood and I was like, ah! Good luck. Uh, so that that ended real quick. <laughs> um, yeah, core moment though. So yeah, so that, that that's where it started. And um, I would say I was very goal oriented. And by goal oriented, it was like you know, like I didn't really I didn't get an allowance. You know, other people, other kids got stuff. Yeah, whether it's shoes yeah. or video games yeah. or whatever. And my answer, you know, like you're in a situation where people have and you don't have, but you don't really know what not having means. Yeah. You just know that you're different, but you don't understand the yeah. context Absolutely. of the struggle. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you keep going, but you, but you have really nothing to go about after other than what you see. Mm. So you naturally start comparing exactly. yourself to other people. Um and then you, they get stuff. You want stuff. You want to keep up. You want to be relevant or cool mm-hmm. subconsciously. I don't, worry, what, I don't care what you call it. Everybody goes through this. Um, especially in today's, I, I can't it's imagine what it's in, like to be a no? kid today. Oh. Like, you know, Bro. the, whew. anyway, um, you don't have so yeah, like, it'd be like, Hey mom, can I get some Jordans? Like you got some money for some Jordans, <laughs> you know? So that's where I kind of like from an early age is like actually like one of my first, my favorite story is it was like um I like was in like junior high or before and I wanted a pair of Jordans. And I was like, I really want these Jordans. And my mom was like, Do you have you have to work for what you have? She's like, Am I what is I like I've been helping and working and whatever, but I don't know why. I just yeah. think it's normal. So um you know, I, I it got explained to me and I was like, so I basically have to buy something. And sell it for more than what I bought it for, and then compound it up till I have enough money to achieve this goal. Yeah. So the first thing that I could think of that I saw, because it's not like original, but I had seen people before selling candy. So I'd go to Smart and Final, and I would buy Airheads and Sour Belts, and I would sell them for twenty five cents each, or five for a dollar, or yeah. bag them up, or whatever. Yeah. So. Um, that's how I bought my first pair of Jordans. I would wow. slang candy at recess and lunch. It's amazing. And uh, that, I, that lasted through middle school, beginning of high school until I found other stuff to sell. I don't how, how'd your entrepreneurial endeavors there just to like get what you wanted and get by evolve? Like what were some of the things that you did? I don't know if they ever really evolve, right? Like, um, my thing and like, I think the, uh, I think the thing that I still like struggle with is like, what's your goal? Like, you know, like the goals are always changing. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think naturally everybody, you know, thinks that everybody else has it figured out. It's like, oh, you know what your goal is, yeah. your end goal is. And I never really had a goal. I just, I just wanted to have fun and, you know, bring people together. And, and, you know, obviously that, that comes to a head at some point in your life, you know, like, or it doesn't. Yeah. You know, just that really ultimately determines. It was like, um, my thing, I, I always just got high off of selling shit. Mm. Candy, uh, car audio. Was it the sale or Coo- the money? It was the sale, bro. Like, it's the v- velour suits. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. fake chains. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's whatever there's a demand for. So I was like, I always say, like my new, I've always struggled with it. Like, what do you do? Like my new answer that I'm really proud of is I feed people. We'll get to that <laughs> later. Um, but ultimately, you know, am I allowed to cuss on here? Hell yeah, you are. Fuck I just, no. I just, fuck you. My ultimate passion. <laughs> and I think what I always selfishly enjoy is I just like creating shit that people fuck with. Off top. I think that's the most, that's the ultimate, like, there's nothing more than that, like, seller's high, or what I now define as, like, helper's high, because it really just comes down to, as you evolve, it's like, what value can I provide to this person or this exchange or this society that not only yields a profit for myself, but provides value to the other person and hopefully, ultimately, has a greater good yeah. attached to it, whatever that is. Um, so... That's I think that's what drove me through college. Off rip. Yeah. Can like, you recall the, the shit that drove you 
like the 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 the, the endeavors that that you embarked on or the scenarios that you were involved with that kind of drove you to get there in in terms of just like look now we can look back and be like yes this is what had happened but yeah. during those times like can you was it was it clear to you like what were those things that gave you that feeling then so i mean like i said i, I sold candy out of my locker yeah and that was like you know a it's like the the most basic thing you think about it. you're a kid every kid likes candy so you're naturally getting high off of your own supply. But then other people want candy. And you're able to Talk provide value, satisfy their, yeah. you know, yeah. whatever. So that would eventually evolve um, into reselling books or finding a way to get your hands on a wholesale license and buying car audio from, like, the downtown audio district or buying wholesale um Sweatsuits, velour suits, jeans, shoes, <laughs> and either returning them to, to department stores to get store credit <laughs> yep. or cash back or just licks, right? Yep. Just really yep. hitting a lick. Yep. Like, it's just the idea of, I got over, I, I got yep. over on something. Yep. You know, I took a shortcut somewhere and it was, you know, which ulti- which feels good in the moment, but could, it could ultimately be damaging. Absolutely. Right? Because you're, what are you building of, 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 of substance? So, mm. you know, as that continues to go, like, I did a lot of man. I I like sold gas. I had a carpool. Hold the fuck up. No, hold the fuck up. No, hold the fuck up. Before yeah. we go anywhere else from there. So there's a kid in my high school. His dad was an I, ambassador. Like, y'all like how I didn't even need to say it? Yeah, I didn't even need let's to get, say let's it. Let's get into the great, gas story. It's a great story. <laughs> let's get into the gas story. So yeah. there's a there's a South American country that a kid in my class, his dad was the hold ambassador. Hold the fuck up. To. You went global with this shit? No, no, no. So a kid in my high school class at Loyola High. I won't say his name because you know he still he probably still doesn't know this. Yes, Enrique Valdez. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> his pops was the ambassador to a country in South America, of course. And with that came you know access or whatever it is that he had. So he didn't drive, but he smoked a lot of weed. And so what you need to buy weed is you need money. So he had, he didn't have a car, he had a driver, but he had gas cards to every mm. gas station, Shell, 76, whatever. So I found out he had a gas card and I'd be like, yo, I'll give you five bucks. If you let me use your gas card, I'll bring it back tomorrow. Right. And I'd say like back then a tank of gas was like eight, nine, 10 bucks, yeah. which is the difference is everything in the world, oh, yeah. right? For real. So, um, every week, weekly, every week you need a you need a tank of gas. I'd be like, "Yo, John Doe, <laughs> <laughs> what you call him? En- Enrique Valdez." Yeah, that's fucked up. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, and then and then I then I got hip to the. I'm gonna get it every Friday. So I could fill it up again before I come back into school. <laughs> yeah. And then I started having my friends meet up with me at the station. And then I charged them 10 bucks a tank when the gas went up to like 15. Like yeah. whatever it would be, yeah. it would be cheaper. Yeah. yeah. So that was like my value system. Straight like, brokerage of petroleum. I, and then right I would there. just hand it back. And then eventually that, that burnt out because um, it's like, you don't even drive. How do you have a $10,000 <laughs> gas bill? And he was like, man, I don't, I don't have the plug anymore. I'm like, mm. That's Oop. crazy, bro. Uh, right. <laughs> there's, something, there's something to be said though about like selling. I've I've done. Have you you sold a bunch yeah. of shit? Yeah. Yeah. But there's something about it when you get into it that can be kind of addicting. Like I don't know what it does when you close. It's, val- it. it's validation. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's just it's getting- you. It's it goes back to you found a way. Yeah. To create value with your approach to you know like and. Ultimately, like you should be creating value, like ethically, right? Absolutely. And, and when we'll, you know, but at whatever point, it's like, however you justify it, ignorance is bliss, right? Yep. So you have a way to put, you frame something or a story, and people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it depends on what you're ex- like exerting that effort towards. Is it towards a greater good? Is it towards, uh, a lifelong career as a doctor, a lawyer, a yeah. journalist, whatever. Like, what are you building towards? Yeah. I think is the ultimate question that we should all ask ourselves mm-hmm. as early as we possibly can, which yeah. is what we were talking about earlier was, yeah. you know, why? Like, for what? That's the most important question. Sorry. That's the most important question to me is like, 
whenever you're making a decision, like for what or for why? Yeah. Why are you doing it? You know? Did you have those moments at all when you were in like your teenage years? Oh, all the time. But, but not really. But like, when you had those moments though, what was like the answer? Or was there, was, or was, was there? I don't know if there was. I yeah. think it was just like, I, I, I think you, I think you like chip away at it. Yeah. You get older. I think like you have moments where, whether you're in reflection with yourself and you, you, ch- it's like a, uh, it's like a Kendrick Lamar album. Yeah. You go through the album and like after every song, it pieces like the longer sentence together. <laughs> <Yo>. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, I remember you was conflicted. <laughs> Ooh, that is happening. And then yep. you, you're like, and then you like resume. Yeah. You, you're constantly. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's, that's what I, pre- that's my interpretation of that. If we ever get to that part, but yeah, it's just, um, I think you, whenever you decide to be present and remember, those core moments that made you and developed you and um, have the the fortitude to mm. to remember and connect the dots. Yeah. And not beat yourself up if you didn't sooner. Yeah. You know, I think that's something that you, we get you caught know up what, in now. I, I want to touch on something because it's like I wholeheartedly agree, right? And it's one of those things where regardless of how long it takes you, the ability to do so is is like what being a man is right asking those questions asking why being able to trust yourself uh and your ability to like really think deeper right but like it's it it's a trip when you start to think about how much more it means when you're older and and your decisions really matter as opposed to when you're younger right but then we also get into the play of like find out what you like what you like and what you don't like far younger and like the more the, the 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 quicker you are to like understanding these things the more better off you'll be but i feel like it's really hard for us even even the ones that get it in the end right how could we like how could we even tell our younger selves or some younger cats that are going through it to believe that with without actually going through it or what not having it is, you know what I'm saying? No. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. I so, know. I know what you're saying, but I, uh, the answer to that is that's that in and of, of itself is. I think we like progressively begin to overthink shit. Word. Right. So. Which means what? I think that there's. I think life is very simple. I think there's an inner voice that's like true to you. That's like, that's, um, that knows deep down what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. And whatever you choose to do, whether it's right or wrong, like as long as you at some point get to, to notice it and to, to correct it. I think that's the point. The whole point of the whole shit is to just get better. Yeah. Right. And it's to not be hard on yourself when you get it wrong. It's to give yourself a get like, and this is real because I suck at this, and it's and if, if I did this more, it just you know make for a better everything. But you're like, like give yourself some love when you get it right, mm. you know. Like my like favorite quote, and I don't know who said this. I kind of think I made it up. <laughs> so, but I don't want to take. Quote by I don't want to name me. It might be me because I can't think for the life of me. And I, and, you yeah. Know, but it's it's nobody's gonna want to fuck you if you don't want to fuck yourself. Straight up, right? Like, it's it's it comes down to confidence, and and that's something that you have to constantly. It's your your emotional intelligence and how you feel about yourself is 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 something that you have to exercise regularly absolutely and it's the same way you exercise your body it gives you physical results um there's things that you need to do for yourself for your mind that you're always going to have to do there's no like one and done shortcut to it you just have to you have to wake up every day and you have to want to fuck yourself you know hold on can we take a moment of silence yeah i have to pee <laughs> Wherever the fuck you are, you go ahead and pee, but wherever the fuck you are, get to a mirror immediately. If you're driving, look at your motherfucking self in the rear view, right? And ask yourself, do I want to fuck myself? I think that's a very like significant point, though, when it comes to just like 
growth as a human being. You feel what I'm saying? And w- with that in mind, for myself, and I feel like for a lot of kids coming up, like college and that experience is one of those formative periods where you you start to really think about that concept because after college, the real life is coming up, right? Did you, like, wh- what was that experience for you like in college? And, and, and were you kind of reflecting at that point, whether it was you were acting on it or not? Like, wh- was that one of those moments for you as a, like, young adult in the making, right? In, in where that experience played, like, a significant role for you, like, college, quote, unquote? Yeah, so I went to college in Santa Barbara. I went to UCSB, UC, UC Santa Barbara. Uh, best place on the planet, by oh, the way. It really if you've is. Ever spent it really any is. time up there. Um, I got rejected twice from there. I was man, supposed to go there. Fuck. It, I, it's for, for reasons that niche. It's, it's, God bless that place. God bless um, it. I would say that, you know, again, going back, I was academically excellent. I always, you know, by any means necessary, get a good grade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily by like, you know, the, yeah, you know, I just, however it worked out, I would get it. Um, so I I was fortunate. My mom was able to pay my tuition through college. Amazing. So like she paid for my, I mean, you know, like, you know, she, she took care of her part, but I, for the most part, I had to take care of all the extra stuff. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of kept the hustle going. I would, and <laughs> this is, this is probably, okay. So I had a girlfriend that lived in San Francisco. She went to college in San Francisco for my high school girlfriend. And I was going to visit her and, and my other friends. And, um, I met this woman on a plane. She sat next to me. And uh, she was flying from L.A. to San Francisco, San Francisco to Han- Hong Kong. She's from China. And, you know, we just got to talking. I asked her what she did. And she worked for a factory that made um, very popular fashion items, brands that you would know, luxury handbags mm-hmm. and footwear and whatever. And her job was she, she was basically like the plug. Straight up. And I was like, hey, if I ever wanted to buy anything from you, you know, how would that work? She's like, here's my info. Hit me up. Email me. Email me. Email was super new. Seller, I had like a, a dot, seller. My yeah. dot edu. At Netscape Navigator. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we, yeah, I was, I was, I was in Santa Barbara. You know, I would became friends with like the sorority girls and I would be like, Hey, I have handbags, you know, like send me what handbags you want. I would, I'd, send, I'd email pictures. Again, this is like very basic email, like dot edu yeah. servers. Oh, yeah. So like, um, you know, I would email them to my girl and she would send me back, like, I, this is what I got, quality, shipping to me. And then we'd have purse parties at these sorority houses. Purse Stop parties. Stop that. Purse parties. You had purse parties? I had purse parties. And, uh. Um, what the fuck? Hold the fuck up. What the fuck was that like? Cause, like, you're a curator. So all the. Take me through a purse party. <laughs> Pops so, out of a case. Was it Alpha so, Phi? Tons of purse. Was it? It was all, all the, all the yeah. sororities you know and love. So at our school, every, <laughs> every Monday evening, early evening, all the sororities, that's when they all had their meetings. The major, like, sorority girls. So I would start with, my neighbor was, a was, was, was in one of them. So I would just go to her and then they have friends at other houses. And I was able to get, like, my friends involved. Cause so you made all, it a Greek thing. A purse party. Yeah, and I mean, it was very, it was very social and personally, it was great. <laughs> it was very gratifying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then in the summer, one of my, my best friends growing up, um, he and I in his garage would sell your favorite sneakers. Mm. Um, cause she was in charge of that factory as well. So. Wow. We'd go around on the weekends, we'd be at the Fox. You just peruse the plug. We'd walkie talkie to, we'd go. I was a salesman, so I'd go into the finish line, the foot action, like, yo, we got the, we got the Jordans on the roof of the play, of the parking lot. And just go up to customers. Yeah, I just go, I just strike up a conversation. People would come up and then during the week, we would just sit there and play pool and ping pong. I don't know, we'd play So ping were these pong. fakes or the real joints? Uh, and or high quality fakes? Very, very high quality fakes. Got it. Triple A's. Got it. Sorry, everybody that's ever bought yeah. some J. Those SpongeBob Dub Zeros no, were not real. <laughs> look, everybody, everybody like perusing on Alibaba, you know what it is, like yeah. pre Alibaba. Yeah. So, uh, that's how we got through college. On Lit. top of, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was fun. Again, so, you got, you got, you create value, right? So like my, my price point would be, 
double either whatever was higher of double what I pay for it or half of retail. You're the young Indian Paul, Paul Orphelia of, of UCSB. I respect that. Don't know who that is, but I hope he's... Kinko's. And he started in SB. It's wild. Didn't know that. Regardless. Does he have a how I built this? He doesn't. He should, though. He's a fucking OG. Yeah. Almost failed out of college. What's his name? Paul Orphelia. Paul Orphelia paging Paul Orphelia. Uh, we need you on Mama. We made it. We Episode do. Ooh, Professor 53. Paul. You know just put it, it out in the universe. Paul Orphelia is OG. All right, P.O. I'll tell you that. P.O. P-O. Now here we go. Yeah. All now right. here we go. Um, so you were in tune with, with, with the sorority life. Like, were you in a frat? Like, was, yeah, was your college just... I was. I don't you talk were. about that much. And, yeah, I was in a, I was in a fraternity. It was called Kappa Alpha Psi. Kappa um, Alpha Psi. Yeah, it was very small. Very so not, not a big, not a big what, presence are, are on the UCSB chapter. Chocolate chat beer. caramel? Yeah, chocolate caramel. Chocolate caramel. Yeah. What was that like? It was different. <laughs> so for, for, for anybody that doesn't know, Kappa Alpha Psi is a African American fraternity, is it not? Yeah, it's a black fraternity. I want to know what it was like for like an Indian kid with wave to be in a, in a black fraternity. So I think that growing up, I, I, I lived in predominantly like black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Yeah. Uh, my, all my friends growing up were black. That's like in the absence of a father, you know, like a, of a figure. Like, I just think I just, I didn't, this is where I identified most with culturally, yeah. musically, Word. um, my pseudo parents, you know, um, oh, the Martins were black. Yeah. 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 Shout out to the Martins again. Oh man. And thank, fuck Mr. Cooper. Thank God. The Martins are better. Yeah. yeah. Thank God for, man, that, 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 that'll play out later. So, um, yeah, it was like, you know, I grew up in a place in a part, you know, where like I'd still have to endure the same struggle as non-white people, you know, brown, black. We all have like the same plight, just, just different. And there's like underlying things there. And um I didn't really I wasn't I just wasn't exposed to my culture, you know. Did you enter college with your homies? Like, was no, it like a I core group? I didn't really know anybody, but wow, I was wow, wow. gravitated. There's always like my friends that I would always gravitate to, you know, and um, and like um, in high school, I had like an older friend. He was a kappa, and like it was just something that he kind of like. He was, I was I got to go to the college parties and I had a good time, and I just kind of. Um, yeah, I just rock with it, and then when it kind of came up, I was like, you know, you you want to belong to something, and there mm. it, it didn't really exist. So like my thing has always been, I want to create something that doesn't exist. Yeah. But as a foundational element that exists, like yeah, a, 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 a operational system. So why not create it? So you band together with your friends. And yeah. Like, hey, is this something we should explore socially, and you go through that process, and you create it, and you know, and then there's. Um, you know, there's any, this is a, this is a big bar. Anything you create has, there's inevitable responsibility yeah. that comes along with it. And I you think that that's what we all, that. you know, in our youth don't really acknowledge, you know, that's a hundred grand candy it's bar. Anything you create, anything you're like, Oh, I have an idea. Let me put some action towards it. And you oh build it. God. And then it gets to a point where it's fun until it's not because mm. you have to work and you have to maintain it and you have to, you know, um, so yeah, we, we like do weird. Santa Barbara's a predominantly white school. Yeah. So yeah. it's like 90 plus percent Caucasian. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was interesting. I mean, look, I, I had a great college experience. Off rip. Look, no, the, the, the reason for, for my line of questioning and I'm not Chris Darden and this isn't like an OJ investigation. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? For me, it's like the beauty of the cultural elements. That like not only like are okay, I'll take it to college, or a microcosm of your scenario and the macrocosm of this like white picket fence in Isla Vista that y'all are in, right? Is not only are you at a predominantly white college, right, but you're also an outsider joining a black fraternity. And Sans everything else, my my question is, what was that experience like for you? Like being the in, was it was it something that was common that cats that were weren't black or in a black fraternity? 
Like, did you have a Pakistani homie that was like no, cousin with no, you? No, no, it like was. You know what it was? It was like, like I was so ethnically ambiguous. Yeah, hell yeah, you were. Automatically thought that I was black, and I just never say that. I Off was. rip. This is a there we big go. thing to admit. Yes, <laughs> and we're we might have to cut this out. This <laughs> There's no way. Stand I'm standing here. This is on my Hassan Minaj esque. <laughs> I you fucking love we you. We didn't give him any credit. We you had, had a do rag on. Um. But like it, 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 it's funny. No, but it's like, if I if I ever day, did stand baby. up, the the theme of the the um, the stand up would be those years, right? Ooh. And it's like, yeah. So we'll have to talk about that offline. Off but rip. Yeah, it was. Um, look, being a part of that it was it was great. We we won hello awards. Um, <laughs> I respect that. I, we like chapter of the year, undergraduate of the year. Yeah, like I got plaques. But I got plaques. it's where I, I got plaques. I got Kappa plaques. But like the you real deal is, it's like it's an just like anything else. Anything else that you start is an opportunity for leadership. One right? trade. So you become you have this goal. You're like, yo, we don't we're we're a chapter, but we're associated with like UCLA and Northridge. Let's create our own chapter. Yeah. Um, we did that quickly. Lit. The minute we won that, we got that. We won a Lit. lot of shit. Mm. Lit. Um, you know, you learn a lot of stuff about leadership. You learn your strengths, then you learn your weaknesses. Word. You know, like um, we we built something beautiful, and it was it was cool to be a part of that. And, and, Incredible. And then you graduate. Incredible. Now graduating, mm. and forgive me, Rashi. I, I saw you take a breath. Graduating. What was your outlook? Like what what was that? I like? never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, See? and that is to this day like my shit. I like people had very specific, like when I when I went to my ten year high school reunion, everybody had their path: real estate, yeah. doctor, lawyer, politics, whatever. Never knew. What did you right? major in in college? I majored in business economics, um, double majored in psychology, and minored in education. So I feel like there's that moment uh, really? in college. Yeah. I, I, I was, I, I was done in like three years and a little bit. And then I had to just, you know, just interest wise and electives. I just got to magnify it. I always feel like there's that moment in college, like about halfway through where you look first year is you're partying your ass. So I feel like, Oh my God, I'm free. Like, let's do this. Alcohol. Yeah. Uh, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> I can do whatever I want. No, like, he had purse parties. Yeah, like, purse parties. To this day, I haven't heard of a fucking purse party. And then year two, yeah. Year two is like still some of that, but you're coming to the point of like I could. You're, you're trying to like keep that first year you're alive. Under, you're an underclassman. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're trying There's to no keep commitment. that commitment undeclared. Yeah. I mean, I, I went into business in the beginning. Yeah, but, but you know, you no be intention. Undeclared. What's your yeah. why? Exactly. Right? What were you talking about earlier? Yeah. yeah. No. And then, but then when you hit the third year, and especially the fourth, the fourth year. Like everyone around you starts to know what they want to do. Like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go off and I want to do this. Ladies and I gentlemen, you're that. hearing the Caucasian mentality. <laughs> no, I'm, no, he. Oh, it's, I'm, it's, hey, don't even talk real. about me. I'm, I'm, I'm the fucking like eight year student. I respect that. Who was like, I just want to play bass. Most people kind of start figuring their shit out halfway through college of kind of like what they want to pursue, what their kind of interests are. For you. You didn't have anything that you really like locked into. It's hold tough. On, hold on. Can I interject? Were you perpetually the hustler's hustler? Yeah. What do you mean by that? But yes. Okay. Well, I think I know what you mean, and the, but the answer is yes. But I want to. What, I, what, what I mean. What I mean by that is this. It's better. It's what I mean by that is this. Right. Is because you alluded to something when we were talking about sales. Right. Of. The ability to the do chase. that. The chase. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And Hell yeah. it's one of those things where knowing you and, and, and being close to your journey, I completely connect with from the standpoint of when you're naturally good at certain things, right? You start relying on your natural abilities. And you get comfortable. And you get very comfortable. Yeah. Mm. Even when your comfort is like exquisite. Yeah. Even when your comfort is waggy you beef. You know what I mean? You feel me? You're still but Yeah. No, I do. <laughs> no, no, but once you start going through like the real world, you realize like, bro, like, am I wagyu beef on a plate or being created by a Michelin star chef? 
Or am I Wagyu beef in the fucking Atlantic Ocean where a great white is gonna just fucking like sense me out and eat me off rip? You naturally were bred and, and have been raised in a scenario where <clears throat> if you were the type to take it, the responsibility of it, you would be the hustler's hustler. And everything that has happened in your life up until this point has equipped you with the hustle mentality. Well, yeah. I mean, everything in everybody's life. I mean, I, yeah, yes. I mean, but in, in general, in theory, it makes sense. Like, you know, everything you've ever done has prepared you for everything you're about to do, hopefully. Sure. Right? Like the, the things that resonate. So it was my graduation day and everybody was talking about their job or what they yeah. were going to do after college. And I had no idea. Like, I'm like, I got the diploma. I got like the the honors. What you call it? I didn't have any real. I didn't have any debt. You know, I was just like, what am I gonna? What now? So I had I had no idea. You know, like I I did know that hustling was not a sustainable life. Sure. Like I got my through some, myself through college. You know, purse parties or, you know, just not a series of things that I didn't necessarily, like, that weren't sustainable ways of life to right, make a living build a career and build a life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, had, I had no idea. Like, I, I, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know. So, like... I knew I was moving back to LA. So, you know, where you're going is half the battle, I guess. And, um, you know, I had only grown up around my mother's business, like business business. And she didn't know what she was doing. She was winging it. Sure. But, you know, but like I'd, I'd been around production and production services and, you know, all this stuff that came along with, you know, finishing a, a, a film or something with video. Um, and I was like, oh, maybe I can, maybe I can tap into my Rolodex and see who I know, um, I and mean, get an internship or get exposed to something. So I took a gig at a production company, um, as an intern, um, was fresh out of college, like a week after I got out. And my job was to run, run, run stuff, pick stuff up, drop it off, get this, get that, like nothing that really pertained to production production i was yeah. just free labor essentially mm. and one of my jobs was to pick up and drop off like these these tape decks basically essentially like big vcrs this is when hd high definition first came out and they mm -hmm. had like really big basically vcrs and they're heavy and they're expensive and people didn't buy them they would rent them from somebody else that bought them so, like, every other day I found myself picking up and dropping off these tape decks. And, um, you know, it wasn't long at all. It was like a week or two before I was like, yo, why don't you just buy one of these things? Like, why are you renting them? It's like, well, we don't pay for it. The client pays for it. I made a joke, and I was like, well, if I just bought one of these, th you know, I didn't know anything. I don't know anything about yeah. you know, equipment or financing anything or buying anything. Would you just rent it from me? He was like, yeah, I don't see the difference. You know, it's the same thing. All right. Wow. So um, you said you said that to the client, or yeah, I mean to my my boss, oh, essentially boss. the guy wow. that was. He was like, mm, you know, so um, you know, so I started doing some research, you feel me? Oh. and I was like, oh wow, this this thing costs X amount of money. If I finance it for X amount of years at this amount of interest, this is what my monthly payment's going to be. And this is how many days this one person, you know, I just did the basic math and I was yeah. like, oh, this, the amount that he pays for it is more than the amount that I'm going to pay for it. So the surplus is mine, yep. or the profit. So that's, you know, um, but I was 22. I didn't know like what a line of credit was yeah. or a loan or financing or any of that. So, um, my mom's business had grown. With no, you know, uneducated woman. So, you know, it was a series of getting done dirty before she would like, you know, yeah. st one step back, but two steps forward without really even realizing it. But, you know, she, she'd outgrown the apartment and 
you know, our life had gotten better. Yeah. Awesome. You know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't great, but it was, it was better. Yeah. It was great to see somebody commit to something for whatever reason and see it all the way through and watch their quality of life improve. Right. I mean, that's the goal for all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I was like, I'd it'd only been a few weeks since I'd been at that company when I made this realization. <laughs> and so I, I decided to take a closer look at her business and how much it grown and, you know, long story short, like the people that she had brought on weren't were taking advantage of her or naivete. So at the same time, she had credit. Like her business had credit and had a history. Mm. And I was like, hey, I have this idea. Like I know you're doing these services, but I have this rental opportunity. Um, you know, can we figure out how to, you know, so a lot of the equipment that he was renting, she already owned. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I didn't even realize, I didn't know what any of this yeah. stuff was. At this point, it's beyond my grade. So, yeah. um, brokering it very quickly, realizing, hey, are there other people that need this? And then hiring my friends that were still in college um, to become my salespeople. Um, and I would find out, I would, I would find out who the, the people, there's always one position at all these companies that was in charge of this role. I would, I would all send them a bottle of, um, of, of what I thought was top shelf whiskey, Jack Daniels, <laughs> <laughs> along with a brochure that was like swagged out at yeah. anybody. I mean, other people were doing and this. You are correct. My friend. <laughs> so I would send a bottle of fifth of Jack Daniels and a little postcard, like a party flyer. Like yeah. Ever, we've all gotten party yeah, flyers. I would, like, yeah. from, I would rent from you forever. So you, up. I would send a, a, an attractive friend of mine to all these places and, you know, I build a customer base. And then before you knew it, I'd have, I was able to be in a position where I could finance more stuff and very quickly, um, you know, at, at my age, what I thought I had achieved, you know, success. I was able to retire my mother. I was able to. Wow. In that instance. Within a, within like two years. So this is like 23, 23, 24. Oh my God. Uh, retire her, pay off her house. Wow. Um, Fuck. Buy my, you know, buy nice things for myself, be able to go places, do things. But I'd like taking on some partners that didn't share the same values as I did. How and, so? Um, I'm very trusting. I like, you know, like I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. Uh, one thing I know that I'm, I've never been really good at is on the administrative front or like mm. dealing with the operational stuff. And, um, so that's something I've like notoriously always kind of passed on. And, you know, um, so yeah, I would, you know, I, I saw myself in an industry that I didn't really care for that much. That wasn't really my thing, but I, I found a way to make some money. It was an opportunity. Yeah, it was an opportunity. It and was robust. When you don't know what you want, like, you'll kind of do anything. Yeah. Right? Which is a gift and a curse because half of that side of the coin is, well, we don't have any control over it, of any of this anyway. Yeah. And it's all predetermined for us. And the other side of the coin is, like, you got to know what you want or else you're going to be just doing some shit that you don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and a lot of people are guilty of this, like, you know, whether you're driven by stability or whatever your values are going up and whatever you're determined by. So, um, you know, a couple years into it, you know, I, there was some, a lot of financial setbacks there with some people that were invited to be a part of it that just, and we don't have to go into that, but I would start to pivot you know, around 25, 26, and where can I, where am I now, and where can I take my experience or what resources I have? And, um, I had a really good friend of mine that also worked in the building that was kind of like a client situation to my business. Mm. And I had a setback with a partner of mine where I got left with some stuff. He had a setback with a partner of his where he needed the stuff that I was let back with. So we, we started a natural partnership. So, um, this is before, this is like right when 3D started to get hot. He's like, yo, I do. Mm. Yeah. Did, you, did you leave your, your first business? No, I didn't have to. Okay. So like, I had, re, it was, that's going and you was a, it was a, it was a red man, method man, how high situation. Oh, like, really? Got blunt, got weed. <laughs> yo, cool, we can kick it. For real. <laughs> yeah. Really? That's a great analogy. Uh, it, it, so no, literally it is done. Yeah. I want to touch on one thing because this is like, this is a moment. For me, right? From the standpoint of shout out to all y'all, like young motherfuckers, whoever you are listening to this, this is an incredible moment because, like, a lot of us go through this. Some guys are purely operational, 
other guys are purely vision. Naturally, like it's ideal to be able to have the street smarts, the vision, also be able to be on top of like the organizational elements, yeah. right? But we find ourselves in a position which I feel like a lot of people can relate to. Whether you're purely the operational guy that's partnered with a, a friend or a person you come across that has a complimentary that you, skill that you're set. enamored by their vision and you want to yeah. like use your strength to put it to work, or you're a complete vision guy that through experiences knows that you're a vision guy and also knows what being taken advantage of is. But at the same time, you're not like this kid that has gone to Harvard MBA and understand all of these components. Like you're going through life dealing with these types of things. And it was okay, right? Naturally, we would have, like, you could have wished you knew this or knew that. But in that moment, like, you're a person that has strengths. And especially, like, a lot of kids coming out of college, like, are firing on what they, like, dream to do, right? But you're one of those people that not only within a few weeks of, of, a, uh, of, of like, being an intern or, like, going into an industry did you see a void, right? But just your thought of capitalizing on that void led you to realize that, like, it was very close to home. Right. And that very close to home, unbeknownst to you, amounted into a fucking wave, an avalanche of opportunity that allowed you to do certain things like retire your mom. Like shout out to all the kids like wanting to retire their mothers and get the home and all this at like 26 to 35 and all this shit. You were able to do that then unbeknownst to you. Right. But your idea sparked that and it was able to happen. Along the way, there's intricacies that, in the bigger scheme of things, people don't realize, whether it's partners, whether it's greed, whether it's like human sensibility, or it's just like organizational shit. But you've shown an ability to just like adapt and experience, right? As opposed to like letting a bunch of the extra shit that you don't know or how really arduous it is affect you, right? Was that something that you just like went into or was it something that you just dealt with along the way? And do you feel like it's better one way or another? I think that probably the latter, the latter two, whatever the options were. Um, I don't think you really, I think awareness and self-awareness is something you develop along hard times. You yeah, know? And definitely. I think it's something that you seek out. So I don't know if I had the foresight to really think about it like that at yeah. an early age. I think I just, you know, different things drive you at different points of your life. Absolutely. It's whether it's, you know, some shit that happened to you as a kid or some mom stuff or some yeah. dad stuff or some somebody that told you that you weren't good enough or, you know, constant comparison to other people or, you know, knocking somebody up when you're a teenager and having a child, like yeah. everything, you know, it depends, like there, it's so subjective. Yeah. Right. So there's no one size fits all answer, but I, I think it's safe to say, and I think it's very important for everybody to realize that everybody has that moment or that yeah. series of moments yeah. of, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Or I don't know why I'm doing it. You know what, what the is, beauty what is, is all this for? But at the same time, a lot of people don't have that moment until they're on their deathbed. One trillion. Right? Like, you're doing stuff and, like, you know, whatever drives you. It was like money, 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 money. Yeah. Power, 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 power. Stuff, 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 stuff. Yeah. Access. Whatever. On the spectrum of, 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 of value. Yeah. I just did the quotation marks. Like, value. Perceived value. Yeah. It's all subjective. So, it goes back to the the overall overarching theme of what do you define as like your ongoing definition of success? And are you okay with that definition of success changing? Yeah. Right. What like worthy ideal are you progressively realizing? Yeah. Like what's worth your time? What you have this very finite time on this earth that could be taken away from you at any given moment. What are you doing with that time? 
And if it's nothing and chilling and that's cool with you, then that's cool. Absolutely. It's just being cool with where you are and what you're doing. And then there's just, there's so much color to that, bro. Like, yeah. who, what do you believe? Who do you believe in? What are your, your core values? What are your, you know, like, and these are things that you're, you have to consciously and in some cases, like personally speaking, painfully learn about yourself and realize mm. and then remind yourself that yeah. that's who you are and be okay with that. And, um, that's why I think it's very important to have a support system. If yeah. it's your mother, if it's your father, if you're lucky enough to have your mother and father or a big family or siblings or cousins or wise uncles or mentors, like that's what shapes who it is that you are. Absolutely. You know? And, you know, like, and that's what can also ultimately be your what the fuck, yeah. you know, because you're just flailing. Sometimes you feel like one trillion you know? though, and but sometimes you're flailing into a fucking Michael Phelps but you, restaurant. But your flailing to you is somebody else's Michael Phelps breaststroke. Yeah, you know? you know, terrible analogy, by the way. I'm just kidding. Which one? It's good. Delete, delete my hateration. I Not at all. No, I want that. You know what I'm saying? West yeah. Saeed, and it's all good, yeah. man. No, but like. This is the this is what I wanted to highlight. It's not it? sexy. It's painful. It is. Very. All this shit is painful. It is. Very. Being comfortable, Dang. being comfortable in your own skin is everybody's ultimate goal. Oh, Nobody yeah. knows how to really be able to say that. But you know what's wild is that like hearing that aspect, right? Is that you were fortunate enough to jump into a pool. And this is where that analogy came from. Like you jumped into a kiddie pool. It's a great analogy. Take my iteration off. You did. <laughs> This is Gatorade Frost, the glacier edition, light blue. No, but mountain ice. You jumped into a pool and you started literally swimming like an Olympian. Yeah. But you were also at a stage where you didn't know what that was. So it wasn't you coming in being like, I'm out of college. I'm mapping out my success. This plan. is what yeah. I'm doing and this is what I'm progressively you realizing. Success plan. You're like, but yeah. One of the biggest things now that like to to see it overarching is you are the type of person to put yourself in a position to experience, right? Whether it's good or it's bad. You, you got into something that turned out to be very successful early on, right? And then that moment took you into the deeper inner workings of not only your mom's business, but also like your endeavors as well, which you learn all these things, which the only thing that I want to highlight there is that it's not that you had that goal per se and you knew what you were doing. You fell into a scenario where your curiosity took you to a place where it was abundant in fruitful fucking reward. Yeah. Right? But through that, it also took you to a spot where you were just experiencing a whole breadth of other shit that wasn't the case, right? Naturally. Yeah. But it's not like you had a plan for it, but it was hitting you. Yeah. And you were learning from it and growing from it yeah. and continuing to push through it. Through the wire, through the fire, yeah. Yeah, all of that, yeah. Off rip. Everybody does that. Hell, I, they, I mean, everybody no, has a we'd variation hope. of their shit. No, but we'd hope. that yeah. That's what it is because it's like, we'd hope everybody does that. But sometimes yeah. we think ourselves out of that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's nope. like a Nobody, like, Nobody's going to want to fuck you if you don't want to fuck yourself. For mm. real. I'm looking at myself right now, looking gorgeous. So. Wait till you get those frames, though. <laughs> you did. I did. So let's take it back to the how high moment when when Method AJ and Red, God knows who, got together and like you had the you had the blunt rap and he man, had the man. It was it was my man, dude. Like I I I, I gave at it, you know. Like it was like my my. To this day, one of my closest friends, um, he'd been in the game for a while. He was a little older than I was. He'd been producing um, music videos in the 90s when, like, all the, you name it, the Michael Bays, the whatever, was coming up as a director yeah. making music videos. Oh, yeah. wow. Before they became, and he was like, you know, he, he had gotten into the services business and, you know, doing all this stuff. And when we had connected, he was like, hey, man, 3D is the next wave. Um our industry, yours and mine, are both dying. Um, I'm gonna get in. I'm gonna get in early into producing 3D content, 
and all these this movie's gonna come out that um the guy that directed Titanic, James Cameron, yep. may, is gonna make it's gonna be called Avatar. It's gonna blow all these um these records. And um, you know, a lot of technology companies and networks are gonna start distributing 3D content and mm. nobody's making it. We're gonna be the ones to make it. Are you in? I'm like, cool. Um, I'm like I have friends, I know people with different brands and doing different cool stuff in music or sports or action sports and I think we can find, we can between us discover all the applications for this and, and create this industry. So that's what we work towards. We saw, we had a vision before an end, like, an, like, and look, 3D has existed for 50 plus years. Oh, yeah. But at this time, it's like when technology and the application and the type of content that you could create a very, we thought immersive experience towards was going to be it. And we we're like, nobody else sees this. Nobody's making this the way that we're making it. We're going to, so, you know, we put some years in and avatar came out. It did what it did. It validated our thesis. Um, you know, the following CES, all these companies came out. They announced we're going to do a 24 hour 3d network, X, Y, Z television manufacturer. We're going to make polarized active shutter 3d screens. Mm. So we're like everything that we said is happening. We need to just get after it. So we got after it. And that's, I think that's right around when I met you mm -hmm. is, um, you know, I'm like, you know, at this point I'm like, what am I like? 24, 25. Yeah. Like, 24, 25, and I'm like, I have another company. We're making stuff. We're, we're, yeah. Red Bull is our yeah. clients and we're, we're, we're innovators. Filming. We're innovators. We're leading edge. And, um, you know, long story short, you know, we put some years into developing that. And ultimately, you know, the thing that, you know, XYZ publicly traded global corporation or network or whatever bet heavy on failed for everybody. Mm. And 3D wasn't ultimately a medium that people caught on to. I mean, we did, we made great stuff, but, you know, making something great that nobody's ever going to see right. is something that you don't really realize until you're up on Facebook trying to put yourself on on a status update. Like, hey, if you have this type of television with this type of cable distributor and you give a shit about this type of content, and you're just like, tune no. into this at this time. And then you're like, no, one's doing maybe that. four people are going to watch <laughs> yeah, this. That's too <laughs> and then you're like, oh, shit. And then you realize in the, at that moment, and you stick with it a little longer, when you realize that something might not be right, but you've yeah. already put time into it, it's like a relationship Absolutely. with somebody. Yeah. You're like, I've been in this for X, so long, I might as well keep going and see what happens. I don't mm -hmm. want to waste all these years. And eventually you're like, this ain't going to work. Mm. And you're like starting over. What was that? Yeah. Moment? What's that moment like? Ugh. I think it's hard to... Um, You don't really know when it is. Like, you don't really know. You just keep going until you realize, like, damn, it's been a while since I saw any results. I, I want to ask you, because, like, for you, like, fuck, like, in general, like, what was that moment like for you? I started to question myself. Like, I was like, was my, was my one hit wonder? Mm. Did something that I saw early on? Like I knew I like I always had an imposter syndrome. I never believed that I belonged really? where I was or I deserved what I had. So and to a certain extent I still kind of deal with that. And I, I literally you know, say really being like I feel you. And it's um so you get to a point where you're like damn, I was a one-hit wonder. I got real lucky. I just took an L. And I didn't even really admit it to anybody. I just realized I'm like this is never going to work. I'm like mm. I need to pick up a and my role is always like, you know, and if we go way back through this common thread, which we haven't really touched on, but like, look, I just, I just saw, an, I, I always just saw an opportunity and fill the void, right? Like my greatest passion is to sell. Um, and at that point I started to question Why? whether or not, huh? Why? Validation. I'm good enough. I never got that, mm. you know, like I, and, and it's a dangerous thing to, to not get when you need it in your formative years, going back to that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't get it, you know, you might, it becomes dangerous because then you become a slave to needing it. 
Mm. And um, were you cognizant of that along the I way? I think I've always subconsciously been cognizant of it, and then like it's it became you know it things eventually come to light if you search for them. And I've done I do a lot of work on myself. Like what? I, I'm I'm, when, I'm. Can I ask you when did you start that? Because like to be able to decide to do that, I was on me, a I was on a ski trip with, and I got invited on a ski trip with a group of my friends, and. It wasn't a lot of us. It was less than like a group of 10 of us. It was for one of our friend's birthday. And everybody was young, relatively, but older than me. And everybody was, what at least I, 27, 26, 27. And everybody's like a little older than me, maybe like three to six years older than me. But like we're all peers and it's a small group of us. And, um, you know, like, we're all, at least I'm guilty of looking at somebody else's shit and just assuming that they're popping. As we all are. Yeah, and then that would make me feel bad because I never felt like I was popping. Mm. And um, I talked to the, like, I ended up sitting on the plane with my boy on the way back, whose birthday it was, who's probably the most poppingest. And I asked him, like, what he had going on for the week. And he's like, I have this company and I have all these employees and I have to deliver them this thing. And I told him, you know, whatever it was that I was on my mind. And he was like, I felt like that before I started going to therapy. Um, let me see if my therapist can introduce you to a therapist. And then that's, so like at a very young age, I'm like 27. And yeah. I start going to talk to, cause I never really had anybody to talk to. I just go yeah. places and do things and very uncomfortably pretend like I belong there mm. or, you know, would do whatever to cope and fit in and, You know, like what I said earlier, like our whole, I'm still struggling with this. It's just your goal in life is to be comfortable in your own skin. Absolutely. That is the ultimate measure of success. Wherever you go, you belong there. Whatever you have, you deserve. Whoever you're with is you're good enough for. Yeah. And so on and so forth. And if you can believe that, then you're successful. Yeah. And it's, it's the most simple thing to be able to grasp. And it's the hardest thing to be able to believe. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. And and that puts you through a lot of stuff, depending on where you started and what cards you were dealt when you entered this world and you know, but you know, if if you believe in higher power and I do, I can't really define it. You just believe that you belong you are where you're supposed to be. Yeah. And don't be an asshole and you'll All be good. Right. <laughs> you know, right. like it's so, um, you know, going through that. So, you know, that was a journey I began going on. So here I am, um, rocking with what I, you know, and we're pivoting in every direction. Like, yeah. Hey guys, yeah, I don't no. think 3D is going to work. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to X, Y, Z, C, S. You're seeing all the hype. You've seen all the decline yeah. and then you're starting to like, you know, I'm, you know, and like concurrently with all this, remember I'm in my mid twenties yeah. and I got, I have a little bit of money. So I get to go places and do things and make friends and get exposed to shit. <coughs> and, uh, you know, my thing has always been, I love bringing different groups of people together. Yeah. Like I, it's my it's selling. It's, Hey, you should meet so-and-so. Yeah. Oh, you like them? Oh, they're your friend. Yeah. <laughs> you for know, real. Like it's, yeah. it's a certain pride. It's validation. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, externally. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'd go through this and then there's a point where I, somebody offered me a job. They're like, Hey, um, I work at a big talent agency is right here. When we all know in Century City, um, we're starting to incubate technology companies. I would love for you to be a part of it. You, you know, some great people. And I'm like watching Entourage at the time. I'm like, Oh, that's like, dope. I could be Ari Gold. Yeah. And, and you already end, ended your, uh, this three not business. over. Oh, it's so, not over. I'm so like, but it, but I'm like letting it, now. I'm letting it ride to the wheels all, fall off Got to it. see what happens. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know, like at this point, I've done everything that I can. I'm yeah. not technological. Yeah. I'm a, I'm an opportunity creator. Totally. You know, man. I have a vision. I, I don't know a person. I might see a need that they might be interested in. If, that need could be conveyed effectively by the, the other side that I'm working on and we can create some value together. Let's rock. Let's rock with it. Yeah. As realistic as everybody thinks that it is. Right. Um, so I take this gig. 
And, um, you know, that's right around when I'm like, I'm, I'm on a weekly trip to therapy. Um, I'm like, my identity is in flux because I'm like, I'm a business owner. Am I an entrepreneur? What do I even do? You know, like how? These are real thoughts. Though. These are real thoughts. Yeah. And I'm like 27. Yeah. You know, like. I'm now financially responsible for my mother and my grandmother yeah. that raised me. I don't have any kids. I don't have a girl, but like I've created a lifestyle for me that I have to maintain. Yeah. I now have friends that think of me in a certain way. I have to maintain a certain That's ability a- to split a check at a fancy for dinner real. on a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday and a whatever, you what, know, yeah. like it's. What about your ego at the time? Like- oh, my ego is the worst. You know, like trying to uphold that. No, I mean, it's, it's all that, all that was, is acting up and you're constantly aware of it. And, you know, like your, your, your ego forces you to not be grateful for the things that you do have and makes you constantly focus on the things that you don't have. Yeah. Your ego makes you feel a certain type of way about other people's success. Your ego really blocks your blessings. And, uh, then you acknowledge your ego and you're aware of your ego's presence, but you don't have the skills sharpened enough to constantly fight that battle that's constantly, you're going head up against, mm-hmm. you know? And, but you're acknowledging it and you're aware of it and you constantly push through it and you constantly, you know, fight with it. And, you know, like it's, it's everything. It's not your worth. It's not your career. It's not how much money. It's like, who am I? Yeah. And what is my purpose on in this world? And why am I here? And, you know, am I here to be like the fun guy? Am I here because I can, I know like access to this or I can create this or I'm fun with this on a social level or right? Like it's, it's, Uh, it's that, that thing that anybody in a major city at least like with any type of access can kind of deal with. I mean, right? even just taking a job while you're a business over business owner is a very weird thing. So like opportunities have never been a, a challenge for me. Right. Right. And I think that that's a, a con. I think that you can drown in opportunities. Mm. Right. If you look at the people that didn't have a lot, right. They might not have had like the social opportunity where the right person didn't come to their dorm room when they had X, Y, Z idea yeah. versus option paralysis. You walk in that supermarket and you're like, I'm going to go get some Pringles. I Option want some original Pringles. Bro. But then there's like, now they got sour cream Pringles and then they got four cheese Pringles and then they got barbecue and then they got sour cream and onion. And you're <laughs> like, I just want original Pringles. Pringles. But sour cream sounds good. <laughs> For real, well, I want, I want that let me get a little job. bit of that. You know? and, then you start to, and then, but if you have no core foundational values and foundation and where you come from, where do you know where to go? Absolutely, TGIF was over for real. Carl Winslow got canceled, yeah, you know, off time. Now you're an adult and you have to be a principal no more. that you're like trying to in your mind, but it's like in reality, like in hindsight, it's like, yo, you, you did it, you did that. You know, yeah. and then you get to a point where you're like, again, recurring theme, this is not sustainable. Mm. You know, like, yeah. it's that feeling of like your life is a house of cards. Yeah. Wow. You know? Yeah. And you're like, they're going to find out. They, whoever they are. This yeah. is pre Khaled, pre Snapchat. Off rip. Like, they Off are going rip. to, you know, like, they. Yeah. That's yeah. why I can describe day is off that one track off of um Reasonable Doubt, The Evils. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's it's real. Let me ask you this, like, because it's crazy to think about from an outsider's perspective, <clears throat> being that like look, naturally your intentions are always pure. You are that good guy, you are that guy that opportunity Lack of opportunity is not even a fucking question, right? But at the same time, like, you're questioning. So it's wild at this point, right? And it's gorgeous because not only are you questioning your value at this point and what value really is, but you're also 
going to a psychiatrist to be therapist. able to have a, a therapist. There's a difference. Forgive me. Forgive no, me. No, it's all good. I'm just letting everybody um, know that knows, like, hey. Off rip. But yeah. you're going to a therapist to be able to speak freely. And, like, I remember even at that time, like, AJ was talking to me about it. Like, this is one of those times where, like, my depths of, of darkness were, like, profound beyond belief. Mm -hmm. And he was like, look, like, I can't even, you know. I told him my financial woes. He's like, we could see what we could do about it. And I was just so fucking timid and afraid. I was like, I can't do it. And I wanted it so bad. Because for me, that... Like, again, that's, that experience is a level of, like, vulnerability that you're able to share within your own space. Yeah. And for a mind of this magnitude, it's like, bro, like, and I'll speak on it like this. During this time, I looked up to AJ as if he was somebody that literally, like, was the community leader amongst multiple and the overarching vast community. Right, but then to also like witness and 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 talk with and 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 be present for the questioning of that, while I was also going through my own. What if they catch me? Mm -hmm. What if I'm not that? Like everybody talking about Nushi like that. Everybody talking about like our egos. Everybody's like saying how much we give them, and we're like, fuck, like. For me, it was like, if I feel this empty, am I lying when you're saying I'm giving you something? You feel me? Mm. In in that period, in in that like flux, right? What was going through your mind in terms of overcoming? And was that even a thought, or was it just like doggy paddling and not knowing how to swim? And was there a moment where something clicked? I'd say it's a, da it's a daily struggle. You know, it was it, or it is. And it's like, you know, like it's, it's the blessing of waking up. I've never had a schedule. I've never had to be, any, be anywhere at a particular time. I've never had anybody directly like managing me. So whether I'm an entrepreneur or I'm like in a contractual situation with somebody else or I'm a part of a larger partnership, um, there's no real accountability of me. I'm not the, I'm not, I'm just, there's an understanding of you do what you do and you yeah. create what you create. So, which is not sustainable if you're somebody who doesn't know how to develop a structural, mm. structural boundaries for sure. yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, you have a, uh, you have a vast network or a skill set or interest or access and then people just want your time and yeah and you're like you know I'm inherently inclined to just help people you know if anybody's like I need this oh I know so and so let me connect you with no real thought behind you know strategy behind the future benefit of this connection yeah. or it's just genuine and or reciprocation in mind yeah and that inevitably i think subconsciously becomes painful when mm. you they forget about you you know but that's another thing but i think that's a real human thing that most Absolutely people don't want to acknowledge is. like the the feeling of being left out but mm -hmm. yeah. you know in your maturation you realize like well what do you expect them to do you know, like for real. you didn't put, you didn't say what, what you wanted up you? front. Yeah, exactly. Um, so my big aha moment was in 2012, and I was, uh, I was, I had my equipment rental business on autopilot, which was still producing recurring revenue with very little effort. I had my failing 3D production company. I had my 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 consulting gig at you know this huge talent agency my clients were your favorite actors and actresses and athletes and musicians and entertainers and and like very quickly i was like i'm not really i don't need this person calling me at three in the morning yelling at me telling them that they're telling me that their twitter is broken i'm like you're just, you're just an idiot and Babysitting um, isn't that fun. You know, I, and I'd, I'd gone through, you know, additional work that I'd supplemented with my therapy and, 
you know, just things that I had done to explore, whether it's reading or going to transformational workshops to getting a sure. different consciousness or things that I did later on to really go looking for some stuff in some parts of the world. And um, I had made myself a deadline. And that deadline was, I think it was like June 2012. I was like, my rule was like, you know, at that point, I give it was, and it was a few months before that. I was like, don't do shit that you don't want to do. Mm. So I thought I took inventory of everything that I was spending my time doing and what it was yielding me, like what my return was, you know. You actually sat down, like took the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't hard. Like, you know, I, I, I didn't have big businesses. I had yeah. very small businesses with a handful of employees that, um, you know, personally yielded me a good, a good life. Yeah. But didn't really lend itself to any longevity or any like generational wealth, which is, I think all of our goals subconsciously, you want to be able to create something and build it and be able to pass no? around that property or that asset to your family Absolutely. to create a legacy. Like, Absolutely. right. That's, yeah. Especially when, like, for me, I always felt like I was starting a legacy from scratch because I didn't yeah. have shit. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I was able to, I just basically stopped doing everything. You know, I woke up, I was, was, this is, so I was 28, June. I was like, all right, well, but responsibly. So I'm like, I have this business, it's working, it's making money. This amount of people rely on it. I'm going to pass on these responsibilities and keep an eye on it from a distance. This ain't going to work. I'm not really going to say anything. I'm just not really going to really contribute that much anymore yeah, yeah. because everybody needs to come to that conclusion on their own. This shit that I got going on this agency is just over. <laughs> like I'm just, you know, I don't want to be Ari 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 Gold anymore. And yeah. it's just not what I thought it was. And so like now now you deal with all the time that you have available to you. Um can I ask a quick question? Of course. I've been talking a lot. No, no, no. Just with that, because when when you get to those moments you sacrifice also the money that that comes with that, right? Yeah. Was that hard for you? Probably. Um, but I also think I realized that it wasn't there that much longer. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel like that's that's probably the no, biggest it's barrier a, for it's most a, people. That's yeah, the biggest man, barrier dude, is money. saying like, all right, I I'm doing. A lot of people do things they don't want to be doing because. The money that he yeah. that it supplies, cutting that off, is very very tough. Yes, I just like was it for you. Uh, did you have to have that fear, conversation with discomfort? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was lucky to have created something that's very unsexy that generated monthly recurring revenue enough for you to. I knew that it had an end date. I just didn't know when it was. Uh. So, but I did, I, I did what ended up being the right decision, which is realizing, like having the, you, you have to be realistic, right? With, with whatever you're doing. And this, this, this could apply. I mean, to anybody, you have to be real, realistic. You have to, you have to, Almost on a daily basis, take inventory of what it is that you spend your time on. Yeah. And realize and like be real with yourself. Right. Like that, that's, you have to the, read. that's the key component. You have to read. Though. You have to yeah. read. You know, like I love Twitter. I love I, I know everybody I follow is relevant to the industries that I'm interested in or I have a vested interest in. And you have to know what affects what and what the realistic runway or and like you know sustainability of what it is that you're creating is and uh, Facts. if if it's not sustainable you have to find a way to like you know keep it going till the wheels fall off while yeah. finding something that's going to you know replace simultaneously that and hopefully grow it yeah you know and again all of that is difficult when you don't have any goal initially <laughs> to yeah. begin with sure um I am jealous of people with, with goals. Uh, 
I'm jealous of people Likewise. who are growing up and know from a very young age what it is that they want to be when they grow up. That is something that nobody should take for granted. I don't care who you are. Um, I'm jealous of, I'm not jealous, like I'm learning to appreciate it actually, yeah. but I'm historically jealous of these yeah. things. And, you know, people that have option, not paralysis, just option disability. I'm jealous <laughs> of those people. Yeah. Um, that are like, oh, cool. This is what I get. This is the car that box. I got down. Let I'm rolling like, with, with it. This. Let me rock with it. Let me develop my security. Um, yeah, what do I know? I'm 33. <laughs> like, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I am where I am. And, uh, it's a beautiful thing that, like, you've been able to, like, go through that, whatever that is, right? In, in the scheme of things. You reached a point where you started taking inventory, right? Regardless of whatever it seemed to you, regardless of if you were going to be found out, regardless of your, I guess, attachment with the fact that you've been able to do this this long and it's actually a strength as opposed to who the fuck am I and how much longer can I hold this, right? After you took inventory of what you were spending time on and what meant things to you and understanding that one of the channels that you had built right although you knew it had an end was still allowing you to sustain Mm -hmm. right but coming to a point where you're in your late 20s and going into like the time period of somebody that's cognizant of knowing the value of purpose what was that transition like for you through the multiple, I can't even say out of it, but like through the multiple, like through the ability to do everything and attempting to tailor it down. It's the, it's the hardest thing ever, right? Like you have to, you know, like everybody works, you know, you have your, your thing that you spend time on. Like, what do you, you are, what you spend your time doing, you know? So, you know, very quickly, I found myself back in this position that I was in, right? When I came out of college, like, what am I going to do? Yeah. And I had found a way to clear my time and start over. So you start to go through those old adage, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. Okay, well, at the time, I <laughs> like... Hanging out with my friends, watching the Lakers, and <laughs> drinking. <laughs> right. So the next logical thing was, let's open a sports bar. <laughs> Wild. It was that. I mean, there's more to the story than that. And that's yeah. not my. That's not my story. But you know, I had um, you know, my my spare time was spent um, in a lot of social settings with a lot of cool people in cool places, and you build relationships with people and you know you you go and you have a good time and you introduce more people to that good time and eventually find yourself being responsible for the fun and i think that um you know me and my closest friends were always the ones that were responsible for the fun that other people had and Mm -hmm. then that becomes a part of your identity right Absolutely. Um, how do you earn your invite or your seat at the table or your access or your free shit or whatever it is that you're able to gain from, you know, you, you, you create things, you know, in our thing, in our cases, you know, like my partner in crime at that time was J-Dub. Yeah. And, you know, we lived together for like seven years, some of the yeah. best years of my life. And we would, we would just naturally... We just have fun wherever we went. And, yeah, that's how you, know, you guys. We went. were, we were, yeah, yeah we were, yeah. Jada ripped him off. <laughs> he's so no, no, you know what's really, you know what's really crazy? Yeah, is, that was so funny. Is we had a moment uh, the other day when we were watching fucking. I feel like it was like what game three, game four of these playoffs. And that was recently. <laughs> yeah, the TV came back up. I was like, I have a flat screen. Yeah. So Jada and this story is coming out now since we brought it up, is <laughs> I was an intern for Dub 
which is how I met AJ and subsequently met everybody and you guys else were, in this community. And you guys were roommates. And J-Dub and AJ were roommates at this time. And that was actually one of the first instances where, like, AJ and I had crossed paths. Well, it's because J-Dub, we, we had just moved in together, and he had this... Air quotes, flat screen TV, which technically it wasn't flat screen TV. I mean, TV. look, it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it had a tube on it. But here, look. And this I'll, is like the an advent was, the of flat plasmas yeah. before yeah. LEDs. Yeah. yeah. So he's like, yo, roll with me to drop this off. Wow, I was like, the all advent, right. huh? The advent. The advent. No, not at all. Look, this, <laughs> not at all. I'll be real. Not at all. I, I can appreciate this, like, straight fucking flock move yeah. like come up move. bottom line Anoush lived on like the 8th floor of like some USC apartment complex and we had dropped the shit off and carried it up all these stairs and we delivered to him and this is the no, first see, time like, I no, met him no look I, I, I love and his were, face no, no, was look. just like this is not the flat screen no, but, that I thought it was gonna no, be but, but no, he but, just rocked with it no but imagine the brilliance of this right like I appreciate your. Marriage. I had nothing to do with the the, the, it, the conspiracy. No, I'm not even speaking of the conspiracy. <laughs> nor does it matter. It was a godness and it was brilliant, right? But like, I appreciate your Mayfair moving fucking credentials, but you didn't have that. So this is what happened. I was talking to J Dub about a flat screen, right? And I was the intern. And Dub told me he had this flat screen that was big and it was at a value price. <laughs> Real big. Real big. I went over to the crib. Right? And this was one of those instances where the moment I saw this flat screen with the tube, like, this was a fucking, this was a TV that literally had, like, bro, this was one of the, it was a flat screen, but the one that I was speaking on, like, would be able to be mounted on a wall. Yeah, not the flat screen with the tube. But the flat screen that this motherfucker had was, this is like, Trinitron. Literally <laughs> pre Back to the Future <laughs> when Trinitron. cats went, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When cats went back into the fucking seventies, and it was like a fucking it was like a two thousand something seventies yeah. television. So I went in, and me being the sucker that I was at that time, had to take the D, yeah, and the uh, the L, right? The you L. Have to <laughs> yeah, the L. Cool. No pause necessary. <laughs> Keep it flowing. But as much as AJ would like to like paint this glorious picture of I just was an accomplice bro I didn't do it that's just how we look, met look, look, we're grateful is, for it right Kevin, why are we still is, talking about look, old shit this is not the first 48 and <laughs> you're not like considered guilty before we admit it yeah what I'm saying is this the extent that you helped was from the living room to the elevator to my car I had to deal with the shame of bringing it up to my crib and putting it into my house. <laughs> it's all lit. I thought this was Mama We Made It Me, not Mama We Got a Flat TV eventually. No, but we did. <laughs> and I didn't call my mom. I was an accomplice for it. You weren't an accomplice or a miss <laughs> or a missus, right? Literally, there's no accomplices there because I didn't like. As There's much, no more Hennessy. We drank all the Hennessy. We did drink all the Hennessy. But look, can as we much Instacart as, some Hennessy? I would love to, but we're going to be done with it before then. Maybe not. Ooh, Mama, we took a long time today. Mama, we took a break with it. Yo. Don't battle my base. But also, Trisha, I'm going to finish this point and we'll figure out whatever the fuck happens next, right? Is that there was no accomplice for me because I was actually at one with getting got there. Bro, you, you got... You, you, you accepted You the took guidance. an L, bro. Took you took L. the D. You took the L. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Moving right along. I don't know, man. I did. I, I, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So I had a... You know, I, I, I made this deadline for myself of not wanting to do shit that I didn't want to do and... You know, I found that 99% of the things that I was spending my time on were didn't make the cut. Mm. So very quickly, you know, as you're looking, to, you, I'm not the kind was of guy. Is it hard for you to go through that? I can't. Wa I like don't like waking up and not knowing what I'm going to do that day. Yeah. Like, you know, it makes me feel like shit. It makes me feel like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not doing anything. I'm wasting my life. So, um, yeah, so, you know, around that time, I'd been entertaining the idea of getting in the restaurant business. Um, my really good friend, uh, who was the general manager 
at the 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 main bar that we used to always go to it was called the parlor when we used to go watch the games we would bring a bunch of people and yeah. have a great time he'd always take care of us um he was going through some you know change ups in his career and we were on the side before i'd even made this you know life change developing some ideas for what could be a cool or where there was a gap for some fun in LA. Yeah. And we had identified some stuff and we'd found some spaces and we found a space that we really liked. And we began negotiating leases and, you know, finalizing concepts. And right before we like committed to that space in Hollywood, Hollywood, his old boss at his, his first employer who owned, um, you know, this, this fly spot on Melrose came to him like, Hey, um, heard you're looking to do this. Um, you know, I want out. You wow. built this place. Um, would you want to take this place over? And at that time, we were already kind of talking, and um, you know, we had that opportunity popped up on the goal line or on the eleventh hour, and we're like, "Yo, this is this place is cool." Um, you know, if, I don't know anything about the restaurant business, but you do operationally. We know. Like how we can make this place better. Um, let's rock with this. Let's, you know, let's figure out a way to take this over and make it our own. Mm. Um, and that was the beginning of that. That was that summer of 2012. Um, but again, that was still something that didn't require a lot of my time. Yeah. My, my physical presence you know it was uh, that was never my deal i'm not that's not who i am so other things that were different were i met my dad for the first time that summer oh wow really? yeah so when i was going through like a lot of that therapy and that transformational stuff a, a stranger or somebody that i didn't really know that well and your whole life people asked you like where's your mom from where's your dad from somebody had gone through that and um like, oh, where's your mom? Oh, my mom lives here. We're actually really close. Oh, where's your dad? Oh, I, I don't know him. I never met him. I don't have any recollection of him. So um, you never wanted to know him. Wow. You never really wanted to know why you are the way that you are. You never wanted to know why innately. They went there. Yeah. The circumstances that we were in, they went there. Yeah. And um, and, and then I was like, for the first time in deflecting that question, I was like, Kinda. Mm. Like, maybe that kind of makes sense. Like, you know, at this point, my, like, relationships with women were, you know, they were pretty consistent in that they were inconsistent in terms of, you know, anything long term. There's always seemed to be, like, a a glass ceiling and how far yeah. I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was fine. Like, you're in your 20s. You're, yeah, sure. you know, like, yeah, you... I didn't feel terrible about it, but you know, at the same time, I can't help but notice. So, I'm, you know, I'm, so something this basically stranger says, you know, resonates with me. And I start talking to one of them about it. Like, yeah, if, if I wanted to meet him, how would I find him? You know, like where would, you know, oh, well, I'm, I'm an expert on the internet. So she, um, hits me like a few days later. She's like, yo, I found your dad. He's a photographer in Detroit. I'm like, how'd you find him? She's like, I Googled him. <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> then I'm like, now what? Like, what do I, you know? So I'm like, mind you, this is like a month after. So like June, I like quit my life, basically. I finagle my way or I like work my way or I decide to commit to somehow becoming a restaurant owner. Like, yeah. that's where I'm going to... But, like, it's not what I do because yeah. that's not what I know. There's management in place. The person that I partner with, it's like, he's an operational genius. Shout out to Yanni. Shout out to Yanni. Um, so I'm, like, sitting here, like, all right, well, I, I can but do what you, I but, can. But you also do bring value. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, no, no question about it. A lot of questions about it, but at the end of the day, no question about it. Yeah, um, that's lit. So, you know, c journey continues... Again, very short period of time. Um, yeah, so I um, arranged something within a month to like meet my father for the first time. How can, can I take it to like a little more? Like, okay, so how was that for you? That experience? Where are you going to take it? I'm curious. Okay, so I wanted to ask like what it was like for you to take that step to like 
actually take the first step in saying, I found you. Can we meet? I didn't exactly go about it like the most direct, straight line way. Okay. So what I had always been told about my father, like you, of course, when you're growing up, you're in a situation where you're around a lot of people or you meet people in classes that you're in yeah. that have mothers and fathers. Of course, not everybody has that situation. Yeah. But like a lot of people do and you're exposed to it and you can't help but wonder like, where's my father? Yeah. But like, it's not like it was somebody that I had that I lost that I miss. Absolutely. Somebody that I never had yeah. that I never knew what it was like that existed. But wasn't So there. it was kind of like, well, you know, out of sight, out of mind, no harm, no foul, whatever that falls within that realm of yeah. shit. Um, until that moment where, you know, you had somebody, you know, somebody in your life pops up, whether they're there for a, a moment or a lifetime or whatever. And they ask you a question when you're in a certain presence of mind yeah. that makes you be like, you know, like, and mind you, bro, I was like the guy that, you know, like the kid at the library that was waiting to get picked up or whatever had to do that had extra time that would go through the white pages and find his father's name in his home city and think about calling wow. and not, you know, like it's all that, mm. you know, mm. so like filling a void. So, when she was like, I found him. She's like, what do you want to do? And then on top of all the, the, the things, the terrible things that my, the picture that my mother painted yeah. about him. Um, whenever I'd ask about him, she'd be like, don't talk about that devil. Wow. Okay. He would do this. He would yeah. do that. And the, yeah. those are things that we don't have to go into. Yeah. He didn't want you. And this is how much he didn't yeah. want you. And this is yeah. what he did to make sure that you didn't exist. And, you know, and it was, um, so all that, but then I, I was, you know, at the time that I had this moment, I'm like, I'm 28 years old. Um, I've, I've had enough relationships with, yeah. you know, like, you know, experiences with the opposite sex or, you know, friendships or whatever you want to call them. And they all, for the most part, end in the same way. And yeah. I wonder if it's me or what, what do I lack? What skill do I lack? What ability do I lack? Mm. Who am I not to be able to accept what's coming to me? And then it's like basic shit. Like, do I have any brothers or sisters? Why is my like one toe in from my pinky toe so fucked up? <laughs> like, you know, like <laughs> what real? is like, you know, like yeah. basic shit. And yeah. it was like, but then like, so she's like, what do you want to do? Like, I, I know where he's at and I know what he does. <laughs> I have his e contact. Like, yo, tell him, email him. He's, she's like, he's a wedding photographer. That's what he does. Wow. Email him and tell him that your boss is going to be in town and he's getting married there whenever and he needs a wedding front, uh, wedding consultation. Word. And not, not tell him that you're his son. Yeah. I mean, remember that I was told this person was defined to me as the devil. Yeah. yeah. And what I knew about him, like, you know, and I'm at a point where it's, this is the, one of the first things that wasn't about somebody else. It was actually for me. Yeah. You know? So what happens if I call you? You, and like, I'm also aware of the fact that I've been, I've, 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 I've met enough women or dealt with enough people in like a, 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 an intimate capacity where I realize that there's three sides to every story. Yeah. There's, there's their side, there's my side, and there's what actually happened. <laughs> and I was old enough to realize real. that maybe my mom scarred and you know when she was my age or yeah. around my age she interpreted something and she didn't have the ability to reframe it yeah and therefore pass that on to me so you know but in the event that what she's saying is true I have to protect myself and Absolutely. what I really want to gain from it selfishly I also want to be, have the ability to come from a place of love and forgiveness if it is the truth, but like 30 years, like almost 30 years have passed, yeah. you know? Um, and then for me, ultimately, I just want to know what's left. Yeah. You know, who am I? Cause this is obviously something that I'm constantly questioning and struggling with and, you know, fluffing, if you will. So she set up a fake wedding con consultation. It was like August or whatever that summer, 2012. I go to like Chicago for Lollapalooza that weekend. I have great friends out there. We had a great time. All to prep me for this 
it's the meeting. Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> the meeting. The yeah. meeting. So, uh, um, yeah, I landed in Detroit. I, uh, I have one photo of my entire childhood and I don't have it with me or else I would show it to you. But I went to, I was, I was, my heart was pounding from the minute I landed. I rented my car. Um, I was in Detroit, kind of corny, but I was listening to like, like Eminem or some, something to like pump me up. Yeah. I go to my, yeah. I have literally of my entire childhood, my entire childhood, I have one photo. Wow. And it's a photo that my mother and I took at Sears. Cause she just didn't have, she wasn't equipped to take yeah. photos and yeah. document our yeah. life or her life or my life or any of this. So I took, I went to, I went to Staples and I took that photo and I blew it up like on like a big piece of paper. So I like, I had like, before I gone in, I thought I'm like, this guy doesn't know he's about to meet his child or one of his children or I don't know anything about him. So I'm like, I have to define goals. What do I want out of this interaction? I'm like, I want to know what he looks like. I want to know if he has any children or a family. Do I have any brothers and sisters? Yeah. And I want to know ultimately what like his side of the story was. Or like give him the ad opportunity. I pull up, knock on the door, I open up, dude opens the door, it's him. So immediately I get to see what he looks like. So I, I cross that off my list. Sit down, bullshit, small talk you have with any stranger. Where you from? Do you have, are you married? Do you have any kids? Um, boom, boom, boom. I'm married. I don't have any children. You're not claiming any children. All right, cool. So, well, can I just take it back for a moment? And, yeah. And you could, you don't have to answer this, but just that moment where he sees you, is it like, just got to curious, is it like, yo, I'm your son? Or, hey, I'm I'm good. I he's he's as far as I'm concerned. Like when, when he he's opens selling the door. a service. I'm like, this is my dad. Wow. You know, like really. Yo, you know, like wow. He was whack. He was really whack. You know, like it was <laughs> just whack as fuck. And I was like, all right. <laughs> it's kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's another layer to this that's, you know, we're not going to go into, but so I sit down. So I immediately within a minute, th my three items on my checklist, Checks. one, two, third, sit Bang. down. Um, again, we're in a sales meeting. I'm evaluating this man to see if he's going to be a photographer in my, in my bogus wedding. <laughs> yeah. It's not even close to happening. Um, Tell me about you. You know, I'm like, oh man, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not engaged. You know, so I like, I reach in my pocket, sitting how far you are from me right now, and I'm like, pull out my little, my little Kinko's Staples Office Depot photocopy yeah. of my only photo from my childhood. I'm like, unfold it, and I hand it to him, and I push it across the table, and I'm like, do you know this woman? Wow. It's like me is like a two year old. Are you nervous Fuck. about this? Fuck yeah. I'm like. Fuck. You know, so I'm sitting here like. So I like hand it to him and like he picks it up and he looks at it. And what, what seems like forever, like he's yeah. staring at it. And yeah. he's just like. And then like immediately, like, you know, after a while he goes, yeah, yeah, I, I know her, you know. And like, let's be real. It's like a way that one of us might look at somebody, you know what I mean? Like yeah. um, that we may have hung out with or spent some time with. And he looks at me, like not connecting the dots of who the other person is in this photo. Yeah. He's like, how do you know? I'm like, that's my mother. And then he looks at it and then he looks at me and then he looks at it and then he looks at me and then he's like, starts shaking and he starts crying and convulsing. And then he looks at me and he says my name and he says my whole name and then I affirm it. And then he stands up and he jumps across the table and he hugs me. And I'm standing there like, I could kill this guy right now and nobody would ever wow. know. Like nobody knows him here, nobody knows the connection here. Is that pain? Like what? no, it's just yeah, it's everything. It's 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 literally a culmination of every insecurity you've ever had in your life that Word. could you could trace back to that, with which is a lot, right? Yeah. Your your relationship with the people that brought you in this world is 
the first experience that you have, yeah. whether it's w your personal memory or whether it's during your conception or whether it's during, you know, your, your mother holding you and what you're subconsciously taking in, like all that shit sticks with you and it formulates you who you are like for yeah. the long run. And it, it can make you or break you, you know? So, um, so that moment happened. I kept it together and, um, you know, we sat down and we had bullshit small talk. And then I was like, look, dude, um, you know, this is who I am. This is what I've been able to accomplish in my short time on this earth. This is where I am right now in my life. These are some walls that I'm hit, handing up against. Um, I figure that since you're, you know, partially responsible for my entry into this world, you might you'd be able to provide some color, you know? So here's your chance, you know, like you're, you, you, you don't have any children, you know, so you're technically meeting your only son, which you've acknowledged. And, uh, you know, is, is this true? Is it not? Is it true? And you've changed. Do you regret anything? Like, I just think about how I would be if I had yeah. met my only child yeah. That's yeah. A, as a man, that's a man at 28 years old. Um, you know, whether I was right or wrong, you know, like, yeah. And he just didn't think it was any of my business to know what really happened. Oh. And, uh, there's a series of back and forths and it's pretty anticlimactic. And, uh, and yeah. And then he asked me to leave. Wow. It was a very short interaction. Uh, whatever you can imagine that it would be. Yeah. Uh, the awkward moment though was, I left my Blackberry inside to, to charge. <laughs> <laughs> so I like got in my car. I'm like, this sucks. I'm like, re. I'm like, damn, nobody wants me. Ain't nobody praying for me. You know, like it's. And then I'm like, but I need my oh, shit, Blackberry. where's my phone? And then I'm like, so wow. I walk back in there and I like knock on the door. I'm like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yo. That's my, that's my rim device over there. It was, yeah. And then, uh, my flight wasn't until the next morning. So, you know, driving around Detroit is, sucks. Um, and then that was that. Did you put a past you or did you like, did it, did it affect you? I don't know if I'm past it. Or um, yeah, I mean, it, it sucked. I treated myself to a week long vacation in the British Virgin Islands. Shout nice. out to Rebecca Prince for the, the hospitality. Mm. Uh, future Mrs. William Smith, yes. aka Mrs. J Dub. Congratulations. Yes. I love you guys. But yeah, that, I think that, you know, that was something that either way, no matter how it went, you know, um, it just so happened to work out that I got to be there by myself. Yeah. And, you know, hang out in beautiful beaches and just reflect and go through whatever that was for the immediate future and then kind of go about my merry way. So, um, you know, come back. Um, what am I doing with my time? I'm like, moonlighting as a restaurateur. Uh, my best friend, one another, one of my really close friends. Um, I don't know, man, this guy's a, this guy's a pit bull, but, uh, yeah, he's managing Nas at the time. And, uh, you know, he had a lot of, and he still is. And he was, uh, you know, I, I was playing in the sandbox at CAA in the technology world and, you know, entertainment world was starting to get, um, introduced to, to technology mm -hmm. opportunities and investment and, you know, so we, we had, we had reconnected not that long before that, just on some social stuff. And, you know, I had a little bit of experience and I had developed a little bit of a taste and he had his own experience being at the epicenter of the opportunity. And we started working together and, you know, investing and throwing our own money at some stuff and something that I didn't really know. And I think that, you know, at the time, he may not have really either, and that was just something that we did. But again, it was something that didn't take up a ton of my time. Yeah. Um, so I kept going. Uh, one thing that I haven't really mentioned is I've lost an abnormal amount of like people that were at what point somewhat close to me to suicide. Mm. Um, mm. So, you know, 
that was another like lingering cloud. Like I, I felt like it was <coughs> for like three or four years. Every year I had lost somebody that I had spent a pretty good chunk of time with in some form or fashion, whether one-on-one or socially or, you know, to, you know, them taking their own life. And these are people whose personalities and drive and aspirations or lack thereof were very similar to mine. Mm. Um, something that I would continue to bring up in my, my work that I was doing on myself through therapy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, on top of growing up, I'd, I had been around that. My, my mother suffers from depression and she, you know, as you can imagine, everything that she's kind of been through, there were, yeah. there were times where she didn't really want to live either. So I, I had to deal with that when it, when it came up more, when it surfaced. So, you know, obviously, so you, you go down this path and, you know, as, as inspiring as dope stuff is that your friends and your peers and people that you look up to are, uh, darkness is inspiring too. When people mm. look for, you think they might, you know, when you're in a place that you could relate to and people kind of exit stage left forever mm. and you might be like, hmm, maybe, you know, like, I don't know. It's not like it's, it's there. Yeah. It exists. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, you're going through your journey. Or, meanwhile, mind you, you know, life, happy, go lucky, fun, come here, enjoy yourself. What can I do for you? You know, it's all love. It's all, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, so you have to keep in mind and I, I have a feeling I'm not the only one here or that's listening that can relate to this, but it's easy to be able to numb your own pain by pretending like everything's perfectly fine. You know? So 100%. I'm, I'm going down this path. I'm going to my therapy every, every week. My, my therapist is like, yo, you should go volunteer somewhere, you know, like maybe that's what you need. Or your, or the other, the original thing was like, Oh, you should go see a psychiatrist. That's why I corrected you earlier. Got it. Um, I think you're depressed. I'm like, no shit. I'm depressed. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. uh, this is something that everybody in my family suffers from. We've already talked about that. Everybody is treated for the, it. The difference or, is that they, they prescribe medicine. Yeah, yeah. So they're like, you know, I'm like, yeah, well, I know a lot of people that have that yeah. and they're taking this and they're not any, they're, it's not necessarily anything or any situation that I aspire towards as yeah. better. So if I'm going to be in the pits anyway, like I might as well not need to be dependent on anything. Yeah. Too. So, uh, the, the alternative was go volunteer. And it, initially I was like, man, I went to, I went to Catholic school. We had to do community service to graduate or yeah. I was in, I was in college. I did student government. I was in a fraternity. We had to do, I won awards for community service, but it was like the intention that goes behind it. So anyway, she mm. like really sold me on like all the studies of volunteering and giving back and giving your time. And I'm like, all right, cool. I'll put volunteering on my, already lengthy to-do list <laughs> never it was just one of those things week yeah. after week when i would reevaluate what i had to get done that week it just never got crossed off it would just carry over and roll it's over it's like the journal that you want to write like at the end of the night you or know what I'm just something that's like mm, yeah i should really look into this yeah <laughs> you know? yeah but i got uh, all these other things first yeah, yeah. Mm. so my um thanksgiving comes around same year 2012 and a friend of mine is like, hey, I'm going to volunteer. at the." And mind you, Thanksgiving is like one of two designated days of giving. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that's when you're really like, I should really. giving in the title. I yeah. should really go and do something for somebody else. Yeah. Right. So it's, you know, not, I'm not not guilty of this. So she's like, hey, um, I signed up for the soup kitchen. Um, do you want to roll with me? I'm like, great. This has been on my to-do list. I need to get around to this. Anyway. Cross it off. So um, I go with her and eh, the experience is kind of whatever. Like I'm no shade to anybody that was giving their time or any of the organizers that took the initiative to organize the event, but I just didn't feel connected. I felt pretty disconnected from it. Like mm. I felt like, you know, because it is Thanksgiving, like the way the, the food, like just everything was just, it was just, just like didn't, a task or something. It just felt like a task. Yeah, yeah. Like the way that the people that were coming to get fed were being treated. It was like they were being herded like cattle. 
Uh, the people organizing it weren't very nice. It wasn't very fun. Like the, the offering was kind of whack. Um, the mayor came, gave a speech, got off, gave a speech in Spanish, <laughs> mm-hmm. came off his podium, fed like, fed, handed a meal to one person, took a photo and hopped in a town car and just dipped. You know, you just like service, like, yeah, run, and run like through, go through the motions. And that was just a feature of it. Like overall, like I just, I just left not feeling, you know, like, and if, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm admitting that I'm selfishly going searching for something, because this is like, that it's a task. Yeah. Um, I left feeling like I didn't accomplish anything. Mm. Um, so go back to the drawing board and I'm just, you know, back in the daily routine, the daily grind, the daily like masking of your stuff. And, um, yeah. When did, when did, I guess, you know, trying to tie this in. Well, no. I, when, I, when did when did you find yourself with giving? You know, well, uh, it wasn't that long. So, I mean, you have Thanksgiving, right? Which is the the second designated day of this is is Christmas. So, you know, I um, fast forward a few weeks. Christmas rolls around, and uh, I'm, I'm hanging out at the house. Remember, I live with J Dub. Our friend J D was over. Uh, it was Christmas Eve. And they had, on their they on their own they had gone to um, they had gone to Target and they bought a bunch of toys. And then they came home, and all three of us we wrapped these toys, and the goal was for us to all roll down to the children's hospital. And this is Christmas Eve, like it's night. We this was a spontaneous thing that they had thought of, and then they came back, and we we made all these gifts, and then. Um, we had gone down to the children's hospital and they were like, the, the nurses were like, Hey, you can't hand deliver these to the kids, but you can leave them under that big tree over there and we'll make sure that they get them. Mm-hmm. And we're like, okay, cool. But not like, really. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, like, like, so for me in the back of my head, I was like, Oh wow, this is another opportunity for me to see what this is about. And you know, so at that night we had all gone, gone out to eat. And, and then they had gone, they had gone out and then I went home by myself and I was sitting there and I was thinking, I'm like, I really got to get around to this item, you know? So I decided the next morning that I was going to, you know, I woke up super early. I was really dark place. So I was waking up. I couldn't really sleep through this whole, this whole period. I'm like up at 5 a.m. laying in my bed, laying in my bed thinking, all right, I should really go volunteer. I like open up my computer, start Googling opportunities. I couldn't find anything. Like yeah. the things that I could find were already booked up or there's just not a, it's not something that's been optimized or built for. So, um, I had remembered a really, our neighbor who's a good friend of mine as well. Her name's Felicia. She would on her own. Um, and I just remember seeing this on Facebook. She would just buy like, you know, a handful of food, feed like 10, 15, 20 people, and then throw it up on Facebook, talk about her experience on her day. And I was like, I could just go do that. I don't need to go join a big. Mm. And then like, so I hit her up cause she was over, she was on the East Coast for Christmas and I called her. I was like, Hey, um, I'm going to go to the store. I don't really know what I'm going to get. I, th- I think I'm just going to feed like a hundred people. Could you kind of guide me through? And then she told me what she did. And then I got to the store and I like, bought enough food to feed a hundred people. And I was like, at the time it was like, it's like six in the morning on Christmas morning. So yeah. I'm like getting premium deli meat, premium cheese, fresh yeah. bread, Everything's coming out, all the gushers, all the yeah. premium flavored yeah. potato chips, the Capri Sun, the giving. water, the Reese's pieces, the Hershey's kisses, all like the, the things that you're, you're, you would get in your meal as a youth then would make other kids jealous. <laughs> Like the bomb lunch that other people yeah. would look at it and be like, "Hey, you gonna Whoa. eat that? Let me get that." You know. So, um, For real. Yeah. I come home. Um, obviously, I live with Dub. JD spent the night he was on the couch. They woke up. The three of us are just in here playing Christmas music on Pandora. Uh, Dub's in the dining room writing "Merry Christmas" on the bags. Um, we're very inefficiently making all these sandwiches in the kitchens. And, um, we're just having fun. Some other people come over, like, pe- like people that called to be like, Merry Christmas. It's our friend, uh, JD's friend, Sarah, who became our friend and my boy, Jeff. And, and then it was like, you know, we're just hanging out in the living room, listening to Christmas music, 
you know, drinking some champagne yeah. and very inefficiently making these bomb sack lunches. So then we uh, hop in a car, we drive around Santa Monica, Venice, just looking, basically looking for anybody that looks like they could use a meal, but more so some like human interaction. So it didn't take us a very long time to kind of like, you know, suss out the situation and then just make a direct impact and just hand somebody a meal that looks like they could have used it. And then we all kind of had our moment and, um, I didn't even have, I had just signed up for Instagram like that week. So it was like, uh, everybody's like, Oh man, I took this picture. It's dope. Oh, let's share it. And then I'm like, Oh, it's yeah. I posted something and jokingly tagged it with hashtag lunch bags, but like the hashtag did spell the word hashtag out to make fun of hashtags. And it, cause most people didn't use them properly and it rhymed with lunch bag. And it wasn't like a thing. It was just like, Oh, let's just, so what it, that's what we did. Yeah. Fun thing. Let's do it. So, you know, we, we had our moments. We each individually shared it with, you know, whoever followed us or was friends with us on whatever platform. And, um, you know, later in the day, we're all checking our phones and we all have these calls, texts, likes, comments, emails, um, like, con- like, you know, expressing their interest in what we had done. Like, Oh my God, that looks, that looks amazing. Or, I've been looking for an opportunity to give and I couldn't find anything or I've never heard of this organization. Um, let me know the next time you guys do this and we'd love to join. And we're like the next time organization, like we just made this up. This <laughs> yeah. is a fun, spontaneous <laughs> yeah. thing that we just did for like selfishly internally, like for myself. Yeah. And you know, like you talk to them and you've had them here, they've had their own stories and their own journeys. And I think we all have, and you know, I think we'll get to the punchline of that. And only I can speak to my own experience for that, but you know, we, we had enjoyed ourselves so much and we were like, let's, let's run it back. Like, let's just do it again. Let's do it next month. Yeah. Uh, we had invited some, some of the people. So, you know, we started with five. We made a hundred meals. The second time we did it, it was 10 people. Half the people I didn't even know. They just came because somebody else knew them. We made a couple hundred meals, shared it. Uh, same response, except one of my old clients at CAA retweeted it and she had five million followers. Wow. And I was like, you know, I had, and this is early influencer days yeah, and you yeah. don't like people are still trying to figure out what that yeah. means. But I'm like, I had, you know, that's what I worked on while I was in that, in that world. So I was like, I should, we should probably build a website. Mm. You know, we built a basic site. Uh, you know, I'm Indian, but I'm not technical. I'm the worst Indian ever. <laughs> I, I could barely force quit an app on my laptop, you know? Um, so we built this very basic site that was very, you know, general, not specific to any of us or our stories or our reasonings. Um, and I'll preface it with like, we're all good people. Like we all inherently help people like that particular group of friends that I really appreciate. So here's like the, 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 the three tabs were some friends wanted to give. We didn't know what to do. This is what we did. Second tab. This is what we did. And the third tab is your st- the steps on how you can do it yourself yeah. down to a grocery shopping list down to a playlist of what we thought was cool that got our feet moving yeah. and um, down to a call to action, you know, feed somebody, share your experience, tag it with this and no real more, more reactive than anything because we had got this look. So yeah. at that point, you know, we, had, you know, we shared it again. A bunch of other people were like, you know what, let's just do, let's establish a cadence right now. Let's just commit to this as something that we do. Um, we're already purveyors of fun. We might as well just do this yeah. as that adds to it. And it helps us, you know. So we decided every last Sunday of the month. So the following last Sunday was, uh, just happened to be my birthday. And I'm like, I own, I own a bar. I own a, now what's now a successful restaurant. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, and I, I like to, I like to celebrate my birthday and I, 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 I can throw a party. Let's make this my birthday party. Um, so a lot of people showed up. So we went from five people the first time, 10 people, and then like a hundred people showed up. Yeah. And, and for me, it was under the moniker of celebrating my birthday on top of the people that, you know, we collectively yeah. generated interest from. And now we had like a sandwich making station. At that point, we were like writing love notes and we, we had just, thought that it would be cool to write something from our heart that would acknowledge the other person, not just with a meal, but the humanity that's in them and the innate need Mm. that all of us share to be acknowledged, right? That's the one thing that we all need, that we're seen, we're heard, we matter, we exist. And that 
you know, like by feeding somebody with that meal and that message, you you know, we realize that we're really feeling ourselves. Yeah. So every last Sunday of the month, that's like no matter where we are, what we're doing, whatever we're pursuing, this is what we're going to do. And, um, you know, so we'd establish that cadence. But like after a few months, after each of our events here in L.A., we would search the hashtag to see what people posted. But then we started seeing people in other cities doing what we were doing. Wow. Right. So like JD's old soccer coach in Boulder was one of the first people and he would ride around on his bicycle, make like 20, 30, 40 meals and feed like the local veterans that he would see on his bike ride. Or like my friend from high school that lived in New York was like, Hey, can I do this with my friends? Or my old roommate from college living in San Diego. Can we do this with my friends or a complete stranger, you know, that we had never met before, but the internet connects everybody, you know, like you never really know who's watching. So at that point you're like slowly adding like frequently asked questions and trying to implement some type of structure. But before you know it, like in less than a year, the thing was going on in like 35, 40 cities regularly. Yeah. And it was a party. Everything you looked at, like people were having fun. It was mm-hmm. very diverse, different ages, different. Like it would be like your friend's eight month old kid or your 80 year old grandmother. And they'd be here like making sandwiches, writing love notes, bagging lunches, dance breaks, social media breaks, taking selfless selfies, whatever. So again, for us, this was just natural. And we were just like, this is fun. Yeah. So I took the don't do shit you don't want to do from earlier that year and implemented if it feels good, keep doing it. Mm. Yeah. Within responsible responsibility. So yeah. Um that's you know, you know, fast forward, it's been four years and some change. Hashtag lunchbag is now in hundred and fifty cities all over the world. Uh people spreading love, one lunch bag at a time. We're um you know, we're working through how how do we take this this idea and how do we take this community that we've organically built and that's successful because there's no real structure. It's just out of passion yeah. and love and sp- like empowering people to, you know, take ownership of their local area and use their personal platform, whether they have 10 followers or 10 million to be able to utilize their, what they've built for themselves to inspire other people to just be kind yeah. and use it as a way to, you know, Hey, look, this is fun. This is cool. All your friends are doing it. Your favorite XYZ is doing it. But kind of sneak that medicine and wrap it in sweets or candy and yeah. be like, look, we're all, and what you learn through these processes and the, the, the stories that surround it and what people felt when they're on the giving or the receiving end or the impact that they make in the long run because yeah. they acknowledge somebody and that person felt seen. And after whatever their circumstances are, they, they were able to get it together on their own. It's you start to realize why we're all here. We're all here to, to to give. We're all here to love, and we're all here to not just love other people and make our immediate local surroundings better, but we're here to you know love ourselves and do the same thing, Absolutely. which is the ultimate it's existence definition of like happiness and success and making the most out of your your time here. You're short. You're very limited amount of time here. So you know. Um, yeah. Is this where you found what it is you now want to be doing? Like that is has that fulfillment come in? I think that you know again I'm I'm, I'm not I'm not I, I will continue to say that I am not solely responsible for what all of this is. No, sure. Um it's it's the it's it's a it's a faceless effort for the most part. Um I think that what we've tapped into is, you know, if, if I were to have to give myself credit for any type of skill, <laughs> what are you good at? Who are you? You know, like, what do you bring to the table in hindsight based on anything that I've ever created? Um, you know, I like branding stuff and giving it a story. And you I think build communities, probably. Yeah. I'm a, and you, you and that, that kind of gave me chills when we started this whole thing. You're like, you're a community builder. And I, you know, it made me feel uncomfortable because I don't like, how can I take credit for this? Yeah. You know, but you know, like for my role that I've played in this and you know, it's, it's been a beautiful role from the people that it kicked us off to all the people that we know and that we don't know that took the initiative to, to bring this and present this opportunity to the people in their city and show them how, 
Look, we're not ending hunger. We're not ending homelessness, but we're giving people the opportunity to feel what it feels like to do something outside of themselves yeah. mm-hmm. and make it in such a way and present it in such a way that it dispels the myth of needing to have a lot of money to be able to attend that fancy dinner at that fancy hotel to be able to give yeah. or to quit their entire life and dedicate it to working, to social work or to hit a home run with every effort that they make yeah. or to feel like whatever they're doing in that exact moment isn't really moving the needle. But, you know, for the first time in the history of the world, we all have this ability to very quickly share what we're doing. Absolutely. And through that sharing, other people get to be inspired, but not only like, you know, like if we go back to, you know, and this is what I realized when we we're making this official and I was like, you know, thinking about what our mission was i'm like i don't i'm smart enough to know that i don't think we're eradicating any of these social issues that have been around forever but i realized that we are presenting a very unique way of doing something that people have been doing since biblical ages like jesus was turning water into wine and you know bread and fish and all of that like feeding the hungry is something that's been around forever but like really being able to tap into that intention behind why we do what we do and mm-hmm. give everybody the ability to kind of share their own experience and use their own platform, however big or small, um, and acknowledge them as a leader. Like I look at any, you know, and I'm certainly not comparing myself or our movement or anything to any of this, but it, it's this variation of it. But I look at the things that the Gandhis and the Martin Luther Kings and the Malcolm X's and the Cesar Chavez's were able to do with no technology, no internet, yeah. no direct mail even. Yeah. You know, you're going door to door. Yeah. You're getting a million people to show up to a 10 minute speech yeah. that's completely changing the course. You know, of course there's a lot of things that are built up to that, but we, ha- we, we have the ability now yeah. to create quickly. Yeah. And commit quickly and, you know, look at my new shoes, look at what I'm eating, yeah. look at my yeah. trips, look, look at my, at me. look at me. Um, but what you realize is all this connection creates disconnection. Yeah. You constantly fight yourself. I mean, I'm guilty of this. You're scrolling through your timelines and you're comparing your worst to other people's best. Yeah. And you, no matter how good you're doing or how on you are, or how much money you're making, it's not enough. Yeah. And you're not enough. And, but for some reason, when you're creating, you're forced into a situation where you have to be present and you have to be grateful for the things that you have and you get to experience that with something as simple or not, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing beautiful work. Um, our whole thing is just to inspire people to do something. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's where we are now. This, This thing is in 150 cities and counting, you name it, corporation, it does it as a celebration. If it's a, if it's a company launch, a Christmas party, uh, we just won the NBA championship party. We're launching this or we're, uh, you know, we're correctional officers at juvenile detention facilities and we want to teach our inmates or students or juvenile detainees that the way to live is to give. Yeah. Living mm-hmm. through giving. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a dark side of this coin. You go down this path and then you're like, wow, I'm, I'm awake. Yeah. I know why I'm here. And then you're yeah. like, Oh, this is a lonely feeling. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, now you're, a lot of now you go from doing this again. I will continue to say like, you know, my portion and my role that I contributed to the success of this, you know, almost selfishly and being okay with that. Because you know that you're not alone in feeling alone. Yes. Right. There's You're not the only person that doesn't feel like but they're you're enough. able to bring it together. And you're able to harness that and create a platform for other people to come to that realization, hopefully on their own, without making it too rough or too heavy or too committed or too whatever. Um, and then with that comes its own set of responsibilities. Absolutely. Right? Um the end <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. yeah and this is gonna be what's beautiful to see in somebody like yourself is how much certainty was able to materialize out of your own uncertainty and the fact that you were willing to 
let your curiosity and just your life guide you. And it's a brilliant thing that I, I feel like it's a common thread in your life in that even though you may not have known, right, you put it out there. And it's a testament to you being somebody that like has the ultimate baseline capability of being so influential in that as much as life has bogged you down, your uncertainty never stopped you from, whether it's acting or bringing together, yeah, and bless the chaos, bless the not knowing, because that's who we are. Yeah. And you didn't have an answer, but... The key and, 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 and the profoundness of how I view your history is that you're curious to ask, right? Your pursuit of why has led you here, whether we can like uh, truly like accept that or not. Like if it wasn't for your not knowing, we wouldn't be here today. And you're a fucking blessing. And I love you to fucking death. The end. Mama, we made it!